I'd like to uh, welcome you to the December 10th uh, meeting. Uh, it's a joint meeting of the um, uh, Planning Board and the Housing Partnership. Um, for the first, uh, before we get into the agenda, we typically ask if anyone's here for public comment on something that's not listed on the agenda. Seeing none. Um, we'll move into the first item on the agenda, which is the... Uh, um, review and discussion of Agora Partners regarding uh, the report on investment opportunities, impediments to housing, and other issues regarding capital <coughs> and development. And Wayne, would you introduce the presenters? Sure. Just for some quick background, if you remember, Planning Board sponsored and Housing Partnership endorsed or co-sponsored, whatever the language was, a series of zoning changes, Carolyn, correct me, a year and a half ago, two years ago? Um, to significantly increase the allowable density and housing, basically within walking distance to downtown in Florence. Um, and it's been very successful. We had lots of projects. You guys approved a project recently on Barrett Street that came out of it. A lot of other projects have come before you. Um, but we wanted to sort of look at, okay, we, we've done all the things which we knew we could do. We're trying to figure out, are there other steps? Um, and so we got a state grant to hire Gora to, in essence, help us with two or three things. Um, first is help us figure out are there other regulatory things we should do? So we've done the really obvious thing, but are there more regulatory reforms that we want to do to attract more developers to build housing in and around downtown and in and around Florence? So that was sort of the first one. The second one is we have this really vibrant development community, but it's pretty small. They tend to do relatively small projects. We had two developers died four or five years ago, and they were some of our most aggressive developers. And so we wanted to have, again, Agora help us with real estate analysis to figure out, you know, what are the niches that are out there that developers aren't taking advantage of <coughs> to help developers see, yes, there's other ways to make money and other projects to go forward. Um, and then the final thing is we know there's some projects that are going to come forward at some point, Shaw's Motel, um, some vacant lots around URB and URC and the Lyman Estate. We weren't asking them to do a detailed assessment of what could happen in those properties, but we're asking them to use more, sort of think about if those properties get redeveloped, how does this fit in the rest? You know, what sort of projects might work there, what sort of projects might not, both as illustrative examples of what could happen and also just to help us think about those properties. So that's sort of the background. This is all state grant funded. We're very happy and I'll let Christine and Howard introduce themselves. May I ask a couple of questions? Is is this presentation conclude the grant money? In your yes. And so this would be the sort of close of the project. And second, um, will you uh, post the report? So the report's already posted. Okay. Um, I should have. You guys all should have gotten links from us when we did it. I have paper copies for those who didn't get a link. Okay. So I mean, who doesn't have paper copies? So let me know if you want paper copies. I can buy and you guys. Can uh, hi, good evening. I'm Howard Kosloff, uh, managing partner with Agora Partners. I'll take one. Uh, my colleague, Christina Calabrese. Um, we're we're uh, both a development firm and a real estate advisory firm, and our development activities mostly out west. We're based in Los Angeles and New York, and the development activity is on the west side. Um, we use that experience and that knowledge and that, that expertise to help us on the advisory side. So we try to bring real-time uh, best practices, trends, et cetera, to the advisory work. And, and most often our advisory clients are, are cities or public agencies, uh, other municipalities who are looking to understand a, a more market-based approach to real estate strategy. Um, so we, we took a look at um, the, the market here uh, from a real estate perspective, obviously, and from a policy perspective. And so our recommendations and our findings, again, are, are rooted both in policy and real estate. Um, Christina can give a, a quick background on, on our policy findings and some of the recommendations. Uh, and then we can get into a discussion about some of the market components and development components. And as Wayne said, we looked at um, well, really four different sites. We looked at prototypical URB properties, both 5,000 square foot lot and 7,500 square foot lot. We looked at Shaw's and we looked at Lyman Estate. And again, this was to get an understanding of the general market, what development there might look like from a, a market perspective. Great. Um, so, hi, Christina Calabrese. Um, I used to serve on the Amherst Planning Board, so I very much appreciate planning boards here in New England. Um, I 
just wanted to say that we, we really did focus on the, the URB, URC, and downtown area in particular. Um, but as anything comes up, any questions or clarifications, feel free to interject. I'm going to kind of provide a high level overview of our zoning analysis and our market analysis, and then Howard will go into the development <coughs> analysis for the prototypical sites. Um, so this is going to loosely follow the order of the report. And we'll get into the report itself gets into more greater quantitative detail in, in certain instances. Um, our first takeaway from reviewing the regulations and reviewing the, the efforts that the city and you have done over the past few years is that um, this is an environment that is supportive of adding development over time in a thoughtful and responsible way. So whether it's through sustainability and issue, issues or initiatives um, or thinking about where to target increased density in a way that's appropriate and contextual, there's a good environment here for the types of growth that we think the city is looking to do incrementally over time. Um, that said, with the, the increased zoning density that's been allowed in the URA, URB, and URC districts, there might be some opportunities in the regulations to further support that type of density going forward. Um, if you look at the URB, URC dimensional regulations from a prototypical standpoint, um, you can generate a certain amount of square footage based on those regulations in a typical 5,000 or 7,500 square foot lot. That said, if you're entering the site planning process, your threshold for site plan approval is 2,000 square feet. So let's say a, a site could accommodate a 7,500 square foot project or maybe even larger than that, the threshold for site plan approval is much lower. Um, and that gap in between may be an opportunity, whether it's to for lower level projects to do staff approval um, and not go through the formal site plan approval process, um, or just to think about where, what type of density you're allowing long term relative to what the regulations kind of set as a benchmark for going through a, another process. The other uh, kind of check to density going forward is that at seven or more units, you're triggering a special permit. Um, again, with some of these lot conditions, you would be able to do more than that. Um, but the special permit, from the perspective of an outside developer, is a discretionary, highly discretionary process compared to what the use regulations allow you to do. So, um, you know, if, if one of the goals of the city going forward is to increase or diversify the development pool and to attract outside investment and development, um, this would just be a question going forward. A lot of people that we spoke with locally said, the special permit is part of the process. If you're considering a much a larger project, something beyond seven units, you know, maybe 15, 20 units, it's really not a predominant factor. <coughs> it's not something that would think make you think otherwise about going forward with the density. But from the perspective of someone who's not embedded in the community and who would be looking to do a larger project, <coughs> they'd want to understand that process better. So. Um, there are a couple of triggers there that hold back the, the full development potential of what is possible through the dimensional regulations, um, and it's just something to consider going forward. And our report does not in any way say you should allow carte blanche development, but it's just a way to think about the various ways to calibrate <coughs> site plan approval, the special permit triggers, <coughs> and the ultimate density that you're hoping to achieve. So. Um, in speaking in the developers forum that we held this afternoon with a bunch of area stakeholders who were architects, uh, nonprofit, affordable housing developers, brokers, et cetera, um, this was something that was also uh, presented an opportunity for further evaluation down the road should an increased level of density be desired. Um, beyond, those were kind of the main takeaways from the zoning analysis. Um, we, some things that I think are, are positives going forward, uh, the parking regulations are not really a deterrent for a developer, uh, especially in the downtown area, obviously. Um, we, in speaking with the, the developers forum today, something that did come up is it might not be a regulation issue, but there is a market perception issue of how much parking there should be for a development relative to how much is required. So while the regulations don't represent a constraint, 
it is something that's nevertheless something to consider for development projects here going forward. Um, the other minor part of the process is uh, the, the stretch energy code, the kind of incremental cost that's placed on the developer uh, by virtue of that being part of the regulations. With developers that we spoke with as part of the process, they estimate that brings about 10% increase in construction costs going forward, but a lot of that ends up being recouped on the, on the market side with the value. Um, folks find that to be a, a valuable part and a differentiator in the market. Um, from a, any questions on the zoning analysis side or comments? Yes. What you just said about the stretch energy folks <coughs> adding 10% to the development <coughs> that could be recouped from market development. But, but it, obviously it increases the cost, so it affects affordability. So isn't that a negative? It depends on, on who you're trying to accommodate. Um, you know, the developers that we spoke with who have incorporated that into their models going forward, it, it seems as though they're, you know, they're able to recoup that in the value of the property. But in terms of the affordability of properties available, it, it does make it harder to uh, pencil in the same way. And just to add to that, the 10% number is somewhat anecdotal. It's very hard to quantify exactly. It sounds big. But, but it, and, and it can be quite big. For, um, there, there's also savings on the operating side. Right? So there should be efficiencies in operating systems, HVAC, electricity, et cetera. Um, but it's something that the, the real estate industry, by and large, is supportive of sustainability goals. But it's been a very big challenge to try to quantify what the costs are what the marketability benefits are. The operating cost savings are a little bit easier to quantify, but again, you're, you're not quantifying necessarily apples to apples because every individual building is going to perform a little bit differently. And so unless you're going to build the exact same building with two different systems, you can't quite get it exact. But it, it's been, that's been the added cost and something that the industry, again, quantifying it has struggled with for quite some time. I had a question in terms of the 2,000 square foot structure as being a rather low threshold and perhaps not even large enough to accommodate a single family home. Do you have a target that you would recommend? Um, you or know, it's common in other communities. I think the what what we would advocate for is to is maybe it's not as high as what the the prototypical unit type would allow on URB, URC, mm -hmm. but more toward that threshold. And I think the, the minimum that we, I'll try to find that actual numbers breakdown here, um, but let's see here. In the URC district, for example, for a two-family dwelling mm -hmm. with a 5,000 square foot lot, assuming all of the appropriate setbacks, um, you'd get a building footprint of about 2,100 square feet. And if you assumed three stories to the height, um, that would be 6,300 square feet. Yep. So, um, you know, we've we've discussed this with the planning office, and I think just from from our outside perspective, that might not seem as a a huge change, but I think there are some political hurdles there going forward with navigating what's possible versus what you'd want to hold people accountable to. But the the staff level site plan approval might be something to help offset that. Okay. Um, the other question I had is if you've been able to identify um, whether discrepancies or inconsistencies between what's allowed by uses and what's allowed by structures, for example, um, you can have an accessory structure that's within the <coughs> property line. You can have an accessory use within, I think it's 10 or 15, depending on your zoning district. Did you see that as an impediment or It's funny, we didn't, we didn't um, touch upon that specifically, but there is a, a minor discrepancy, I think, in the square footage allotment for accessory unit, which is yeah, 900 nine square feet, versus 1, and then 1,000 yeah. for the accessory that's structure. Right. Um, but I think the planning office brought up that it, there was originally an 800 square foot accessory unit structure. So, you know, kind of 
incrementally increasing that square footage. Uh, and again, something that came out of the developers forum today is, and something that we'll talk about kind of in the market analysis of this is, what are you trying to accomplish with those units? Is it, you know, while from a public perspective, it might be an opportunity <coughs> to rent affordable units, uh, the reality of what's happening in the market might be it's, a, it's an in-law unit, it's a unit for an for extended family. Right. It's providing more density, yeah. but it's not necessarily reaching the affordable rental population that you might be hoping to target through that type of development. So, I guess what I'm looking at is how, as you say, somebody not in the community coming here, they think they find the threshold that they have to meet, and then they discover that somewhere else in the zoning there's another one that they didn't know about. And if we can get them all to be more consistent, it's less intimidating to someone outside. I would say that the the legibility overall, the structure and organization, yep. um, with a with like one maybe minor confusion. I think it was the the permit, not the special permit, but the zoning permit, mm -hmm. um, which which I we're told is a kind of the entry level that you start the project with. Um, but if you're just reading the regulations without knowing that, is a little confusing. But apart from that, the kind of checks and balances from a from you know a developer cu accustomed to reading regulations is pretty legible and, and intuitive um, why certain thresholds don't match up i would attribute more to the checks and balances of the development process and something that's okay. you know the public sector tries to calibrate so that you're not just able to fully execute on what's possible without some checks and balances along the way. So um, I think the overall perception of the, the zoning as it is currently is that it is favorable to these development opportunities. And then the question really becomes, how much are you promoting and incentivizing that process moving forward? And from our perspective, the first thing that we would look at would be the predictability of timelines um, as part of the approval process. So the more discretionary the process, the more variability in the timeline, the yeah. greater the risk. Um, Thank you. So those were the kind of the key findings of the zoning analysis. Moving into the market analysis, we basically first started with an understanding of the existing housing supply and a basic understanding of the demographics, none of which would probably surprise you, I think. Um, the key takeaways being that this is a predominantly single family residential community, overwhelmingly so. Um, but that the rental to owner market is, is all about 50-50. Anecdotally, we've heard today that it's maybe skewing more recently toward rental. Um, but as the most recent statistical numbers show, it's about 50-50. <coughs> um, the age, the, the quality of the housing stock is largely older. Um, there's not a lot of brand new housing stock here. Um, and there's a, a breakdown between the the lower end of the market and the what they can afford from a rental standpoint, the average median income of a renter and what they can afford versus the average median income of a homeowner and what they can afford. And there's a gap there. Um, both would represent an opportunity objectively from a housing standpoint, but from a development standpoint, it becomes a lot harder to pencil projects at the lower end of the market, at the lower rent level. Um, for the purposes of our study, we're focusing on market rate housing because developer won't receive any subsidy, owner occupant wouldn't receive any subsidy either. Um, but it is something worth noting just as a need going forward um, in the housing community. So with that in mind, we surveyed kind of the existing sales, recent sales in the community. Um, Probably also not surprisingly, Village Hill is a standout. It's a, it's a differentiator. It outperforms <coughs> any other area in Northampton um, kind of significantly. In some instances, condo projects are commanding prices about 70% higher than other areas. Um, so this represents a key differentiator and, and really where you're seeing the strength of the market in Northampton um, and really for the past couple of years, I believe. Um, so with that in mind, both understanding that Amherst's population has been pretty steady quantitatively for the past 50 or so years. You're not strongly declining, and you're not strongly growing. Um, at the same time, the average number of occupants per unit 
is going down, so the, the household size is smaller, but your housing stock is, is larger than what, say, the average unit size would hold. Um, we looked at a few prototypical housing products that might not be in the market or might not be in the market overwhelmingly that could be introduced into the market. Um, both things that we would recommend looking into further and also things that you might consider that we just might not recommend and kind of steer you away from but you might think is a relevant product type. Um, the first that we looked into based on the previous discussion is accessory apartments and as <coughs> previously the main takeaway there is while it's an opportunity and homeowners may do it and, and anecdotally we did hear that some people do use it as a rental unit um, by and large, you know, it's not a developer product. It's not something that a developer would do typically. Um, not really feasible in this situation. And given the amount of regulations and, and just from an average person not associated with the real estate or development community, approaching uh, creating an accessory unit over time for the purpose of a rental property or otherwise is probably something that's time consuming and challenging uh, just generally, whether it's in Northampton or elsewhere. So while there is an opportunity to increase density incrementally through accessory units, it's not necessarily something that we'd consider saying you should invest all of your time and energy into because it'll only create small incremental value and it's not something that the development community would really take on. Um, another product type that we looked into related but would potentially be a development product is micro apartments, um, which I'm, you may have heard of before, are very popular in hot markets and they're sub, we're looking at, you know, a couple hundred square feet to 350 square feet, tiny units um, that really are targeted to folks who want minimal space and enjoy amenities either in the building or in the, in the city. Um, and while it was not Howard, and our recommendation was that Northampton might not really bite on something like that, that folks here really would prefer a little more space than that. Um, you know, a 450 square foot studio apartment might be a product that's, that is actually very comfortable for a single person or a couple to live in with a kitchen and a living space mm -hmm. and a sleeping area. Um, so introducing a smaller product, not that small, might be a way to diversify the product mix, both rental or ownership. Um, but we did also hear today from a gentleman who um, owns a property in downtown with very small unit size, I'm forgetting his name, Peter Whalen. Peter Whalen. Um, that, so, but that is a redevelopment project, not a, a ground up project. So there are obviously a redevelopment project a little different but um, we would at least recommend you know a studio product or otherwise um, beyond that there are some things that um, we think might be good fits for as differentiators for Northampton to take it to the le next level of sustainability and otherwise um, while there are increased costs associated with it we have seen that there's been a market demand for more sustainable features and that people are really coming to expect them as part of the value of their <coughs> home and long-term operation and maintenance of the home. Um, so passive house standards or living building standards, which you may be more familiar with, are kind of the next generation of sustainability that are really truly at the, the, the vanguard of development going forward. Um, and this is a thread of sustainability that's regenerative where you're not just talking about development that mitigates environmental effects, you're hoping to make the environment better as a result of development, um, improve your surrounding environment as a result of development, and that this is kind of the next wave of sustainability going forward that's very progressive and you know, in, a, in an environment that's already very receptive to sustainability, this would be a differentiator um, in the market. Uh, last, and Howard might touch upon this a little bit, we have things that you've seen before but might need more of, townhomes or cottage style units, and um, something that we've seen in other communities, small lot subdivisions, and have Howard speak about that a little bit. Um, yeah, so the, the small lot subdivision, um, colloquially townhouse ordinance, townhomes, row houses, brownstones, whatever you want to call it, 
Um, the idea is to introduce a smaller unit type, but they are individually owned. And so if you, I'm not sure, did they get a copy of that? You, you have the presentations in front of you, and, and the actual design aesthetic notwithstanding, because that's a, that's a facade, so it may not fit in Northampton. But uh, the idea there is that you take a parcel, and it could be a relatively small parcel, and you further subdivide it. Um, in some places, that subdivision can be as small as 600 square feet. But the units are structurally independent and the foundations are independent. There's a anywhere from a four to eight inch air gap between them. There's flashing over it so you don't perceive that air gap, but it eliminates an HOA. HOA. They're not condos. They are single family freestanding homes. They don't necessarily look like it, but there's been a lot of uh, market appeal in other markets for those because of the notion of no HOA. Again, you're, you own your home, you own the land that it sits on. There's a series of, of access easements so that, yeah, you have to drive across someone else's driveway to get to yours. You have to walk across somebody's lot to get to the trash bin, whatever it might be. Um, but, but that's a product type that I, I think is worth looking at. Um, and it, it provides an opportunity for further density. Uh, again, in, in some markets, it serves as a transition piece between commercial areas and single family homes. So a little more density. It has a little more activity than a single family home would have. It's not a commercial parcel. And again, that transition from a physical sense is actually working quite well. Um, in terms of, of the three or four, because we looked at both 5,000 square foot and 7,500 square foot parcels on the URB, uh, a very high level analysis that's in the back of our report. And rather than go through every detail on that, which we're happy to discuss further if you'd like, of course, um, the main message there is that right now, we, we made assumptions about construction costs. We made assumptions about soft costs, whether it's permits and fees, architecture and engineering, um, contractor costs, et cetera. We made assumptions on the revenue side, whether for sale or rental. And from the market analysis that we did, we tried to shoot pretty much down the middle and not do an analysis for you know, creating a new um, upper end of the market. So we tried to be relatively conservative there. Um, and then from that, we back into a land value. Uh, it's called a land residual method. And the value we used for that was 25% of development costs. That's how much your land should cost relative to development. And so in each of the analyses, you'll see that there's a, a hypothetical land value there. And that, that could swing. Some, some builders might be willing to pay 30% for the land, or some might only pay 20% for the land. So that, that can, can swing. Um, what we found is that in the, in the smaller parcels right now, where costs are and where the market is, it's hard for those to pencil. And so I think that there is limited activity on, on some of those because of that. Um, For-profit developers are in the business for profit. And so if they're going to look at an analysis and say that it doesn't pencil, then it's not going to get built. Uh, I think that's why you see some, some uh, existing buildings trading, because uh, it's, it's easier and cheaper to buy an existing building that has existing cash flow. On the Shaw's Motel site, um, I believe we had 12 units on there, and that starts to look pretty good. And by getting a little bit extra density, spread the land costs out over, over more units, um, it, those start to pencil. And then we have a, a hypothetical situation for the Lyman Estate. Um, very quickly, the breakdown of that, it, roughly 31 acre site, and after subtracting land for preschool, for a park, uh, for wetlands and for roads and sidewalks, et cetera, you're left with about six acres of developable land. And, and for our analysis, we broke that up into 25 units of townhomes, or 25 units of townhomes, 25 units of apartments, and 26 single family homes. <coughs> the idea there uh, was twofold. One was to think about absorption, that uh, maybe that site could fit a couple hundred apartment units, but that doesn't seem realistic in the market unless you're going to phase it over a very long period of time. Uh, absorbing 200 uh, units into the market is not something that's going to happen very quickly in a market that's used to about 50 a year. Um, 
the the other uh, component of that, aside from introducing different unit types, is it also presents a different development type. Now, we obviously don't own that land. The city doesn't own the land, so it's an exercise where we were looking at possibilities for land that is owned by someone who didn't ask us to look for those possibilities, but it's an example of what could be done there. Um, by separating it into different uses like that, it, it provides different opportunities to develop it. So you could sell the land, you could uh, entitle the land and get permits for the land and then sell the apartment portion to one builder, sell the townhouse portion to one builder, sell the single family portion to one builder. So it's meant to provide some flexibility and, and we think that's a more realistic approach given the, the market and the absorption that, that occurs in the market. Um, again, the, the revenues on the back end there are based on middle of the road of, from our comp analysis. New construction often can demand a premium. Um, if the, the, that new community were to be designed with certain amenities or certain features, and there's a, a whole long list of what those might be, might command a premium. Um, but our, our approach was to look at it as affordable housing with the lower case A. So this isn't subsidized housing, but it's meant to be true market rate housing, not luxury housing or aspirational housing based on where the market is today. Um, so that, that's the explanation of, of how we did that. And like I said, we're, we're happy to answer any specific components of that analysis and, of course, of anything else related to the report. That's what we got. <laughs> Questions, comments, thoughts? Do you have a sense of how much of the development that actually happens in Northampton is done by large-scale developers versus mom and pop? Uh, my understanding is it's almost entirely smaller developers. And for, for an out of town develop, the, the adage in the real estate industry is that regardless, and this isn't an absolute, it's a bit of hyperbole, but regardless of, of project size, yep. it's the same amount of time. So a 10 unit project is gonna take the same amount of time and effort as a 100 unit project. So if I'm a developer looking at that and the 100 unit has more zeros on the end, yeah. then that, that time is better spent on the bigger project. Um, there's also uh, just the reality of being a, a smaller market. It's going to be harder to attract national scale developers without having a bigger project. <coughs> um, that also plays into the, the capital markets environment, the lending environment. Mm -hmm. now, out, of, out of town lenders will be less comfortable with this market, not, not because it's Northampton, just because it's a smaller market that they're not familiar with and they they won't be able to justify the allocation of resources to learn a market where there's for example 50 units a year mm -hmm. um, but that's not entirely uncommon uh, when we were doing our analysis we found that there are, are pretty limited numbers of sites to do larger projects yeah <laughs> primarily it's 5,000 7,500 square feet Perhaps you can combine a couple of those. Uh, land assemblages have their own risks. Mm -hmm. But it, other than Lyman, and, and the way we looked at Lyman, we had 76 units, but other than Lyman, I, I don't see a whole lot of um, opportunities for 100 plus unit developments, which in some cases could be a very good thing. Right. It, it makes growth more incremental and you can control it a little bit more. But in terms of attracting out of state or, or out of the region right. developers and capital, it just makes it harder. Actually, the, you remind me of another thing, financing, you know, financing for a single family house, financing for something that's going to be rented and versus something that's going to be a condo and all the regulations around condos now. Did you see an impact there or any recommendations there? Well, we, we didn't look a lot at, at pure single family development because our, our task here is to think about density. Um, and we didn't, we didn't talk to lenders specifically about Northampton um, because we're out also as developers and we're also doing this work in, in different communities. It's the small local banks that are going to lend on mm -hmm. the smaller projects. If you have a particularly strong market, you might get regional. <coughs> um, the big national banks, you know, if they have a branch here, then, then maybe, but in effect, that's acting as a community bank because you're getting that you're getting that financing because there's a relationship with the local banker. Um, there are markets we've we've done a bunch of work in Savannah, Georgia, for example, which is a very small market, but very dynamic in terms of of 
the different uh, economies that are at play there. And there's some national players that are there, but they also have bigger parcels. Mm -hmm. So financing right now on the development side is not as easy as it may sound like it is in, in the media. There's, there's a lot of folks looking to put money out, both as equity investors and, and banks. They're looking for much bigger projects. Um, the community banks are, they want to lend into a no risk environment. Yeah. Right? And, and there, is, there isn't a no risk environment, but development is definitely not a no risk <coughs> environment, which gets back to, to the policy discussion a little bit, where when, when that process is more predictable, Yep. And that helps with the lenders. And, and I think the city has done a, a pretty good job at making that process more predictable than other comparable um, communities. So again, that helps, but at the end of the day, there's still smaller projects. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, it's probably a little unusual, but we're such a small group tonight. Are there public questions? Can I just ask you to address the special permit criteria for like the two and three unit? Can I ask a general question while she's sure. looking for that? Now, while affordable housing wasn't really part of your plan, when you look at Northampton, just sort of in a general sort of thought process of what the town worked in, did you see any opportunities for affordable housing? So affordable with a capital A? With a capital A. <laughs> that, that is not in our realm, and it's a, as some of the folks here can probably tell you, that, that's a um, combination of very different funding sources. And the development community that, uh, the way I understand it, and I'm, very limited knowledge on capital and yeah. affordable housing. That's that part of it. Yeah, yeah it, it, they operate essentially as fee developers that are getting a percentage and, and they're pulling together different financing sources. And, and some commercial banks have units dedicated to that, but it's a whole different environment. So I'm sorry I can't okay. answer that one. All right, so in our, in our review of the special permit process, um, there are types of multi-unit residential projects that require a special permit in business and zoning districts. Um, so to the two-family dwelling, um, a special permit is required in the neighborhood business district. Um, and beyond that, in, in the areas where we were looking, the urban residential B and the urban residential C, any multi-family or townhouse project creating seven or more units goes to the planning board. Um, as well as any detached accessory dwelling unit. So, um, you know, in in our opinion, that you know that special permit criteria is a is a much more discretionary process going forward. Um, it doesn't at the smaller two-family, three-family level. It doesn't um, come up in the urban residential B or C zoning districts. It does come up in the neighborhood business zoning district. Um, but it is a, another layer of approval that makes it just harder in terms of um, getting things through. Okay. Can you remind me, if they allow, um, multiple principal dwelling units are allowed now, right? Right, on a parcel, yeah. Yeah, and how is by that? By site plan. By site plan, but not special permit. Right, unless but, it, you reach the seven or more threshold. Right, but an accessory apartment is a special permit. A detached accessory apartment? Um, in some districts, not in the A and B district because it is sort of this almost one takes the place of the other. So since we have accessory apartments allowed throughout the city, no matter what residential district you're in, so in the suburban districts and URA, suburban residential and rural residential, accessory dwellings are allowed as part of a single family. That's where the special permit really comes into play now okay. that we allow more than one principal structure on a parcel in the B and C districts. Okay. So it's, I think it's a, another layer of, of check and balance where the use is allowed by right and then the actual design and configuration I think is what's being assessed in the special permit scenario. 
so you're allowed to do it, but it's just how it looks and how it's reviewed. So. Have you run into no. yeah. John? Hi, Jonathan Wright, Vice Builder. I was wondering what your view would be on uh, strategic opportunities for affordable home ownership. Small A. Small A. Small A. Um, <coughs> size A, I don't know. Some kind of A. <laughs> but, but, um, uh, you know, where, what are the unit types and configurations and locations and amenities that you're seeing as being uh, possible? I, the small lot subdivision or townhouse ordinance that we mentioned, that in, in a lot of markets that we're working, that is the answer to that question. Because, because you can put more density on it, then you're, you're extracting more use from the lot. Um, you're providing, depends how wide you build it, but two car garages that are direct entry. Um, you can do a, a very nice three lot only can have to put a townhome with three bedrooms and start to accommodate a family. Um, yeah, in terms of specific locations, I don't have that answer. Um, but yeah, in, in general, we're supportive of walkable environments, and whenever you can do that, then you're going to drive value that way. By being able to put more units on a lot, by, they're, they're pretty simple boxes. And you don't have HOA costs, as I mentioned, so the ownership costs are less. Um, the construction is relatively simple. Um, you're not digging out basements. You're not um, not going too tall, um, depending on the design aesthetic. I understand flat roofs maybe wouldn't wouldn't be the the chosen design here in some cases, but a flat roof is pretty pretty inexpensive to build. So there are ways to to build them very very basically, um, and again with the added density, it makes it you're, you're spreading those costs off over across more units. So in that, if you might interpret that, uh, a row house like you see in uh, Baltimore, mm -hmm. that kind of a concept. That's a concept, which is yes. something we haven't done here, but which is pretty interesting. Yes. Um, I think in Massachusetts, it's still a habitable unit is 600 square feet. I think we have a minimum unit size for habitation. Right, and, and the, the townhomes are bigger than that. Yeah. Um, I like the micro thing, but I think there is a building code uh, yeah. interface there. And, I think, and I think that's for, I think what we heard today is that's for affordable with a capital A units in Massachusetts. Um, just for building. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've definitely seen smaller than that in Massachusetts okay. and more toward, more toward Boston. Um, yeah, Jonathan, we're working on one now with um, 450 square feet. Yes. So I've got a question. When we, we've obviously redone the yeah, we've got till seven, eight thirty. So we might, <laughs> before we should take up the next. One. Um, we've obviously done the the rewrite of the code to try to get infill, but at some point the land cost is going to tip that so that it might be easy. It might it, it might come to a point where you're taking down housing in order to get more density on the lot. Can you tell me what you've learned about that? Do you see that happening here? Certain neighborhoods, um, you know what. What would, what would push us in that direction as opposed to building in between houses? Um, the, so taking a, a one house down to build two or three, whatever it might be, um, first of all, that you're going to rely on local builders for that. Um, that's not going to be something that you, you would get now a town developer for that. Um, I, I, I think there's certainly opportunities. I think that when you get some more bulk to it, so if you can get two or three or four lots, together where you can do that. I think that makes it more appealing. Um, but at the end of the day, we're not seeing, on, on the more dense units, we're not seeing a lot to make us feel great <coughs> construction costs versus values on the back end. So perhaps a longtime landowner whose basis in the property is pretty low, there might be an opportunity there, but then you're relying on that landowner to have the stomach to right, undertake it. Um, <laughs> I, I think, Construction costs are unusually high right now um, a, across the country. Um, it's a, a reaction to having been way down and now there's a bit of a frenzy. Um, so that's not helping. Um, you need reasonable sellers who understand that their piece of property is not necessarily the most valuable piece of property within 100 miles. Um, 
you, you get a lot of irrational sellers who say, well, if my neighbor sold it for X, then clearly I need to get X plus one because my property's better. And so there, there's an irrationality that plays in a little bit. Um, and I think that the market on the back end, the, the sales value or rental value needs to come up. Um, uh, keep in mind that, as I said, we looked at it based on, on a, um, more or less an average comp value. So it, it could be a specific location is better and it's going to drive a higher value or there can be strategic decisions made on finish level or amenities within the house um, that can drive the value higher. But we, we weren't looking at it on a case by case basis. We were making some blanket um, observations and recommendations. So again, that, that's looking over the market as a whole. Case by case, there are, I'm sure there are opportunities where you can drive a higher value. I can just add to that, too. I mean, most of our housing stocks are pretty well maintained, and so everything Howard said makes sense. But there's also scattered throughout the city units that are in pretty bad shape that are creating pretty marginal return, and those presumably are good candidates. Right. right. And you know, in some cases, that may be opportunities. It depends how, how bad they are to do a rehab and add an accessory unit. But again, that, that's most likely you're not going to get the more traditional development community doing that. Um, might be an opportunity for a homeowner, again, to boost their value, or you might get what are, in effect, home flippers coming in to do that. Um, you're kind of pessimistic that we're going to draw in the developer you're thinking of anyway, right? Well, I, I think there needs to be larger scale projects for that to happen. I, from what we've seen, there, there are very skilled local developers who have done some great projects and, and certainly within the region as well. Um, I, I think it takes more um, larger projects to get the attention. So the, the sphere of influence will start to expand. So you know, if, if it's a four unit project, you're going to get a certain, um, certain geography attracted to that. If it's 10 unit, that's going to grow a little bit more. If it's 20, it's going to grow a little bit more. Um, I, it's just, that's the realities. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, it has to do with the lending environment also. Because you, it's going to take a larger project or a very deep-seated relationship between a lender and a developer to, to attract outside money for projects of that, that scale. And, and in the developer's forum earlier, uh, one gentleman was talking about the fact how those relationships that used to exist through the downturn and bank consolidations and bank closings, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of those relationships have dissipated. And so there's a process of building those back up over time. Can I just ask one follow-up? You had mentioned on the small lot subdivision that the um, ownership cost would be a little bit less because there wasn't the homeowners... HOA dues. Correct. But presumably, wouldn't the HOA just be an accumulation of what the individuals would pay on their own? So you'd still have the snow, the insurance, and the other ones. So just can you tell me what the difference would be? How would it be any cheaper? Well, for starters, it's not a mandated monthly cost. Right? So it's still going to be a real cost to them. There, there, there will be some cost. But insurance, for example, is going to be lower because it's a single family. If theoretically one house could fall down and not affect the others. Right? So in a, in a condo environment, if something happens to one, it's going to affect all of them. <coughs> um, maintenance agreements, there are maintenance agreements also that says who has to fix what. But the uh, HOAs often, they have mandatory uh, accounting rules. And so you have to pay an accountant to manage that. They have um, mandatory reserve requirements. So every homeowner is paying a certain amount of money every month to sit in a bank account for the major capital expenses. So at the end of the day, there are some variations that would make it cheaper, but it's not, again, it's not the mandated monthly cost every month. So if, if you don't think you need to tend to your landscaping, and it might be a bad example because that's probably in a maintenance agreement, um, but if your roof is leaking and you can't <coughs> catch it and you think that's going to hold, you're free to do that because if there's a leak and the roof caves in, that only affects you. It doesn't affect the other owners. So it, it's, you're free to make your own decisions about how you want to budget your own money and how you actually want to make those repairs and, and um, assess for those costs over time. 
and I'd be, I'd be free to put in a firewall as opposed to that four inch space you wanted to put between them those are they're, they're all <laughs> firewalls <laughs> oh yeah yeah absolutely and and there'll be different building code requirements in every municipality and we didn't get into those details but again they're they're built as structurally independent and it needs to again theoretically if something happens to one can't affect the other okay. now if one house catches on fire then yeah it could affect the other depending on a lot of factors if one falls down it's unlikely that it's going to fall straight down <laughs> but in in theory freestanding single family homes thank you okay thank you Uh, so, Carolyn, we have the next item on the agenda at 8.30. No, but <laughs> we could see if uh, what you were thinking. Uh, I didn't see minutes, but the carrying at the bottom is other in minutes. Are there anything else you want to cover? <coughs> I don't have anything else unless you have something. Uh, Pastor, as you know, we uh, just awarded today a um, $110,000 contract to Alta Design to do a uh, pedestrian and bicycle uh, comprehensive plan for the city. So we certainly come out back to the planning board and try to get involved in um, This is, you know, the good news is, unfortunately, this is all state and federal grant that's paying for this. The bad news is a very aggressive time schedule. So we have to finish the entire project by September 26th, then we have some deadlines along the way. We actually did two projects. We hired Alta to do the overall <coughs> plan. And we hired PVPC with a <coughs> grant to do an Pioneer Valley Planning Commission to do a separate sort of outreach for low income disadvantaged neighborhoods to try to really get them involved in the process. In the bike head process. In the bike head, head process. And, and yeah, yes, primarily the bike head process, but the hope is that we're also empowering some populations to take part in other planning processes that don't generally. So it's specifically around bike head. But it's also about sort of teaching skills and hopefully getting involved for other projects as well. Okay. Thanks. Oh, one more thing while I'm on grant, grants. Um, we also just got a grant um, from the same source to do a wayfinding program. We had, the mayor's really interested in a wayfinding program for downtown about, the parts that came out of the parking study we did last year. Um, Wayne, what's that term? Wayfinding. What is that? Sign it just to show you where you want to go. Oh. Um, so this, this partially came out of the parking study where I think the estimate was about 20%. We think about 20% of the peak of cars driving around downtown are just looking for parking spots. So obviously if we can help people find parking spots faster, we can reduce some of the congestion downtown. And so we hope to combine this, but again, the state and federal grant <coughs> has a more aggressive time schedule. So we're going to use city money eventually to do a wayfinding program downtown, and that's going to be a slight, we're not, we should be going to bid probably in January. But this other grant's really, this is a federal grant that's promoting walking. So we're gonna be doing signage sort of along the bike path, for example, we have 14 kiosks along the bike path. We hope each one of those kiosks will have a smaller sign that says, you know, it's this far to a grocery store, and this far to a coffee shop with directions, and signage at various points, we have to define what the neighborhoods are. But we're sort of looking at, those places that are far enough from downtown in Florence that people don't necessarily walk, but close enough they could walk, because the whole point of this grant is to flip populations. Um, you know, so for example, Smith College has a parking garage, and on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night, when downtown is really hard to find spaces, that garage is empty, but it's open to the public. So is there a way to get people coming down West Street mm. to realize they can park in the garage, and it's only the sign would say it's a five minute walk, I don't know what it is, but I'm making it up. But whatever it, whatever it is the sign would say, mm -hmm. park here, stupid, it's free. It's it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so the details we worked out, but we'd love to get into it. And that one we have to spend, it's $35,000 of money for us, Amherst and Belcher Dam, the majority for us, um, but we have to spend it by March 29th. So we're pretty happy with it. Is any of that digital? Um, it, we can do, we have a lot of discretion in how we use the money if we can convince them that it's all about encouraging pedestrian improvements. So we're using Walk Boston as our vendor, and we'd like to give both the time on foot and the time by bicycle.
but because it's grant about foot, we're not sure we can do the time by foot. So we still have some details we have to figure out. But anything which we can make the argument, a strong argument, helps people walk, yes. I guess I didn't phrase that right. Um, is this something they could access with a smartphone? Um, it's a good question. A lot of um, people coming into town, they don't know where the parking garage is. But if their phone told them where it was and that there were eight spaces, they'd go there. Right. So two separate things. So it's a media grant. <laughs> this immediate grant, which is CDC money <coughs> through the Department of Health, is very specific. How are we doing? These walking signs we're putting up, and that wouldn't be online. The grant the city's going to do with parking money, I think we're asking a vendor for, for help on what are the ideas, and that could certainly be part of that process. Is. We also talked about you know, the parking garage. Um, you, you know, you see in a lot of cities, signs will tell you exactly how many spots are empty in each parking lot. We don't have that technology currently anywhere except for the parking garage, but it has it. So that would be an easy one. You potentially have either a sign or an app that says the parking garage is 212 spaces. Mm -hmm. um, to do it for other lots requires additional steps. So that's only part of the possibility. We haven't, got, we haven't done that big process yet. So you started to say, I think, that you're going to spend city money, but you're going to get the 35000 back between now and March. Is that? So, so we'd hope to combine these as one bid so we could hire one vendor. It's just not going to work out time-wise. So the $35,000 is the CDC money we're doing by March 29th. Okay. And then at some point we're going to bid probably in January with city money for the park movies. So we want them to be enough of a look and feel that they talk to each other, but they are going to be different. Okay, that's all I got. Happy to hear that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> what did you think of the trip? Right ahead. Yeah. Present trip. Yeah. We'll see you later. Okay. Take care. I know. So, Devin, we can't start our meeting till 8 30 now, is that right? It is unfortunate. Time for start, and so since the public can attend at that time, why are they here? Well, there markets out there. So, I would like to open the uh, 830 site plan review for Wright Builder <coughs> Family House at 97 Olander Drive, Northampton Map ID 31C 17. Uh, is there a presentation? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Jonathan Wright, Wright Builders, 48 Bates Street in Northampton. I'm Jeff Squires. I don't believe you know. But I wanted to introduce Jeff. Excuse me, John. Um, that was oh, yes, my smart. normal disclaimer of the Berkshire Design. Um, because of uh, work I do, I can do several projects with Berkshire Design, and, and, and I'm currently doing one now. I don't think it um, precludes me from being objective, but if anybody in the audience feels differently, if you raise your hand, I can recuse myself from this hearing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Uh, Jeff and I are going to basically tag team this uh, with you this evening. Uh, if you do look at the, the illustration that Jeff has up, the uh, illustrated plot is, is uh, the closest thing we have at Village Hill to infill. Um, it's a piece between the transformations uh, project and the memorial park. And, uh, it emerged as a kind of um, remainder. And so uh, uh, we've developed this project. Uh, it's a heavily sloping lot on the back. It's abutted directly by the multi-use path, uh, which will be about uh, three feet below the finished basement level grade. So it's a tricky drop there. And uh, uh, it was not actually built to be a lot It's um, uh, in terms of infrastructure. So we're proposing to mill the street to uh, bring in the utilities. And in that process, we've offered to mill them the street uh, over well in front of the uh, Memorial Park so the city can get water for the Memorial Park project. So we'll coordinate that. We'll also suggest working with uh, Carter's group that uh, 
will hold our finished <coughs> paving back depending on what the en engineers say so that uh, there's a uh, we get a good lap joint where the milling and happens you don't have a cold joint there so we can work together on that but Jeff why don't you go ahead um, yeah it's fairly straightforward um, as Jonathan said it's it's this lot at the end of uh, what is now a lander um, prior to the, the uh, inner part of positive homes uh, development to the north um, and as Jonathan pointed out the parcel doesn't work on the TV huh that's interesting okay um, so the lot just to the south of the green parcel is the memorial it's a proposed memorial park um, and so what's being proposed is a is a single-family home um, with a walkout basement um, we are trying to capture and utilize the grade drop um, to the back of the property to the, to the best of our ability. Um, we've got a stone wall and some stone stairs that sort of wrap around um, to the east and south um, to the lower terrace patio area and then there's another path that would connect uh, to the multi-use path in the back. Um, again, that's, that's a basement level patio in the back um, on the right side of the image as you're looking at it. Um, there's a small patio also up on the, on the um, upper first floor level um, that's more visible to the street. Um, but generally, um, we're trying to, I, I believe it's a lead platinum home that we're striving for. Net, net zero net positive and lead platinum. Um, so in addition to um, capturing you know, uh, uh, surface runoff, we're also proposing elements like a 1,000-gallon uh, cistern in the back which will provide, which will be connected to a um, hose bib that'll um, feed by gravity down to the lower terrace so they can connect the hose and, you know, water plants and use that cistern water for, for watering plants. Um, there's, yeah, drought tolerant plant material, um, local materials, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the elements that we need to, to achieve the lead platinum. Um, and obviously a lot of attention has been paid to working with the Memorial Park plans and their planting plan and proposal and, and this project so that we ensure, you know, adequate uh, uh, buffering and, and view protections and stuff like that. Um, so we've been working, you know, with their plant list and, and this one to make sure that we have a you know, cohesive, um, you know, project between the two. Right. We're working with uh, Martha Lyon uh, on her plan. <coughs> this project for us is we're going to go ahead and uh, clear and grub the Memorial site. Um, because there's no place to put stuff, you know. When you have small lots, where do you put your stuff? So we work that out with Mass Development. That'll be our lay down area, and we'll be able to leave it for them, so it'll be cleared and grubbed for the Memorial Park. It's been work, great working with Martha to uh, uh, really coordinate the the feel of the planting and the grading. She's great to work with him, uh, Jeff and and the clients, and and we and she have been enjoying that. So you really won't read uh, any kind of zipper line there. There'll be buffering, but it should move. Um, gracefully and uh, these folks are, are uh, um, do have a private meditation center here it's 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 uh, focused on a uh, reflective lifestyle so it's a great location um, for that adjacent to the park with the views and so on fenced in the back as Jeff is showing you some of the materials uh, that we'll use as well mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, and these um, it's a craftsman uh, style arts and crafts uh, with 30-inch uh, overhangs for solar protection um, and uh, a 12,000-watt uh, solar array that will give us heating and air conditioning. And um, we do have gas for a stove, otherwise there's no combustion on the property. So this is the, this is the elevation facing Olander. Um, and then these two are from the north, uh, <coughs> north and south, respectively, um, the lower one being the view from um, no, that's right. Memorial Park, um, which we buffered. So those are the two side ele elevations, and obviously you can see on the left-hand side of the page or the the drawings, <coughs> the walkout um, basement area underneath the, the covered porch there. And this is a visual to close with to give you an idea of. Um, we thought we would propose to uh, rename the street Vermilion Way. And this is a, uh, we like to show historical antecedents for the craftsman uh, modality. Uh, and so this uh, uh, 
thought would be very helpful in understanding <laughs> the Asian origins of the upturned uh, roof lines and uh, <laughs> craftsman style. So. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was risky of you, actually, Jonathan. <laughs> You're building a house for a meditation. <laughs> This actually was, uh, that image was provided by the owner. <laughs> Humor, humorous, so we could not help but share it. Yeah. So, questions? And we're seeing this just because uh, initially it was thought that this, it was questionable whether this lot was workable or saleable. It, so it, had, it, it never came <laughs> to you as part of a subdivision plan. So for it to become an ANR lot, it has to go through site plan approval, even though there's nothing about it that right. is not approvable particularly. It's not anything new to you, but it's, you've never seen it before. Can you go back to, the, it shows both, uh, uh, um, no, the elevations that have the, so the park is going to be on the south side. Yes. And, Correct. and what will be on the north? Uh, uh, the north of the house. Yeah, um, I mean, I know it fits kind of in the middle. Right. Yeah, so as you see there, the first of the energy positive homes houses is, is okay. across the right. border there. Across there, okay, right. across that border, okay. And as part of this work, there are um, there are four specimen trees. There, there's a beech tree that uh, mass development or transformations will, will do some work on that, that uh, signature tree. But there are uh, two oaks and a pignut hickory that need attention. And uh, we're going to, because they lean over the lot and they broke away on the back side, so they're going to get some uh, professional arbor attention as part of this project for the safety of the house, but also tangentially safety of the walkway mm -hmm. area. So you really had to squeeze to get into this lot, both because of the drop off in the back and because of the property lines. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure all of these match the zoning or Carolyn would have said something to us about it, but it just looks like from the, uh, from the elevation plans, the two images on the same screen. Mm -hmm. So the one in the lower right is the one facing the north house, right? Yes. Great. And so um, you're almost right up against the property line there. Can, how far do you anticipate that being from the seven feet? I forget. We're yeah, I think we're five feet from the property line, and then the next the next house to the north is another 22, 24 feet. I remember looking carefully at the landscape plan between your house and the park, and I was concerned that you were create en engulfing the park and I would say that your plan very carefully isn't doing that it's buffering it in a way but do you have even enough room to work on the north side of the house that I was just talking about? Um, we, we haven't planted there uh, our buyers would like to have a large tree there sort of as a as part of the um, uh, aesthetic of the meditation center but we wanted to do that in concert with whoever was going to buy the house next door would want to interfere in in with their solar. Um, so, you know, we're, we're mm -hmm. old collaborators <coughs> to actually figure out what will work. Um, happy to have you stipulate that we should do that. I just, um, the, the lead uh, specifications require us to plant material that at growth, at size, will be mm -hmm. no more, no closer than 24 inches to the building for uh, moisture and uh, moisture management. And so in this case, that wouldn't be, it'd be a hell of a Lombardi poplar. <laughs> <laughs> so. um, I haven't seen a cistern come before us. It doesn't mean that there haven't been and I've missed them, but um, is there anything interesting about maintaining that? Well, it has to be clearly, def uh, we, we have to get permits for it. Uh, and it has to be clearly designated as not potable water. Um, and to qualify, it has to hold one inch of rain from half of the uh, impervious surface of the building. So that's how it's like 960 square feet, 8,000 gallons. Uh -huh. It's um, cisterns always have plenty of water in them when you don't need water, mm -hmm. and there's uh, almost no way to store enough water for when you really need water. You know, unless you're going to go very large. 10,000 gallons. Is it going to go straight from the roof into the cistern? Yes. Right. Yeah. And the advantage to doing it here versus some other sites is a lot of times you see them for irrigation systems or 
where you don't have a grade differential. Um, in this case, it's real easy to put a cistern up at the garage elevation and just by gravity have an underground pipe that connects to a, you know, a, a hose bib that pops out of the ground. When it's empty, it's empty, but you know, you've got it for, you know, without the need for pumps and um, you know, additional um, you know, refilling if it's empty. And so this is a very sort of low tech way to, to take advantage of that, that elevation. Then it provides some stormwater management too. Yeah, for the, the storm surge. Seeing none. I have a couple of comments from DPW. Okay. Um, now, I, I will say that I think this is a two page memo. I only got one page. <laughs> but when I had previously talked, and it was two pages meaning I'm surprised because I only got two, two or three comments verbally from DPW. I think it was just a mistake on the printing. But um, uh, I just wanted to <coughs> confirm that there would be granite curbs on the radii for the driveway and that um, sidewalk, any damage to the existing sidewalk will be repaired. I mean, that's standard procedure when anybody's going into an existing street that if sidewalk panels are damaged, they have to be replaced. We're planning to take them out because they're not uh, reinforced for driving. So they'll, they'll have to be okay. replaced. Yeah, yeah. That's it's good, good point. And this is in that zone. Uh, it was granite curbing and then asphalt curbing and then granite curbing again. So this is in the granite world there. So, <coughs> so uh, I actually didn't formally move to open public hearing, so I don't know that. You don't need to do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, we're going to close public hearing. Any other comments or discussion from the board? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Move to close public hearing. Second. So moved. Second by Tess. Comments? Prepared for a motion. Motion to approve site plan at 97 Outlander Drive, um, pursuant to DPW comments regarding granite curbs and sidewalk repair, and any other comments to be incorporated. Just a technical thing. It's we invented the number 97 to identify it, and until you create the lot, it doesn't actually have a street number. That's our little Just joke. <laughs> so, um, sorry about Thank that. Thank you. Any, anything else you've been? <laughs> 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 well, it's in grand. Yeah. That's really so funny. you can just say Olander. Olander yeah. Drive. Uh, it's been <laughs> north of Memorial Park. Second by Ann. All in favor? Thank you. I hope you get 97 when you go to the DPW. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's going to be. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. It's on the front there. So now I move we open the agenda item for 8.30. That's Um, it was a well, it was continued from October, but previously in September, so it's been continued a couple of times. So I actually don't need to open it. Oh, I just need to begin the agenda item. Is there a presentation? Yes, there is. And it's Jeff yeah. again. Uh, Excuse me, Jeff. Uh, Devin, disclaimer again. New hearing, same uh, disclosure. If anyone feels uh, I can't be objective because of uh, my past dealings with her design, just please raise your hand and I can refuse myself. No? Okay, thank you. Um, I'll try to keep this brief and um, <coughs> not, not go through the whole presentation again. I'll sort of concentrate on the major changes that have happened since we were here last time. Um, touch on those. I'm sure there'll be some more discussion. So um, without further ado. Um, so again, this is the remaining 42 acres or so, plus or minus in the north, uh, on the north campus, the north end of the north campus. Um, we are um, looking at um, pretty much the same, the same project. A um, couple of changes have happened um, since, um, since we were before you the first time. Um, 
most significantly, I'll just jump right to the site plan um, so I can highlight and point to some of the changes as I go through them. Um, one of the biggest changes, a couple of the biggest changes, um, one is the number of lots. Originally, we had 41, 42 lots, I think. Um, it's been now revised to 29. Ooh. The big the big change is that the duplex units that we had previously shown all on separate lots are now split up into, um, I wish the wish the laser pointer worked, but. You need um, to be able to use the cursor on the computer. Oh, yeah, there you go. Um, so these one, these five on this side, the five on this side are now two separate lots with a lot line down the middle and they'll be run as condominium um, type developments rather than a, you know, a single owned uh, duplex. Um, same with, oops, same with these lots, or uh, the same with these duplexes on the, uh, on the central east side is that they are now contained in one large lot as opposed to individual lots. Um, the other the other change with regards to these duplexes in the center of the site is previously we had a common drive that came in um, roughly where the cursor is now that paralleled that there was part of that uh, multi-use trail. Um, we've now dedicated that location to only the trail itself <coughs> that's contained within a 20 foot wide um, essentially right of way that is part of the larger lot to the north which will all be deeded to the city. Um, so that that trail is now separate from the from the access the vehicle access to those duplexes. The duplexes are now accessed via the, um, the drive that goes down to the co-housing. The first two um, So these first two have drive under garages immediately off the parking lot. <clears throat> the remaining three have a shared common drive that also lead to um, three um, uh, uh, basement level uh, garages. So they'll they'll be um, you know enveloped in as part of the um, as part of the house footprint as opposed to the standalone garages that we had shown there before. Um, so that's, that's one of the other significant changes. The other change is we've gone from 82 units to 85. There's been a couple of additional duplex units in the, in the uh, co-housing portion. So the, the total number of uh, units is, um, has been increased to 85 as opposed to 82. Um, there are, um, this was partially a discussion during the last meeting, but the um, traffic calming measures uh, on Olander. We previously had shown a narrowed street from 24, cursor keeps disappearing here, at the main intersection that leads down to the co-housing. Um, we have since narrowed the two other intersections as it joins Ford Crossing to also be a 20 foot wide intersection uh, or 20 foot width up to that first driveway that's closest in these case, both cases is the first driveway on the left. So that section of road of Olander as you come off of Ford Crossing is 20 feet wide. Once that you pass that first driveway on the left, <coughs> back out to 24, and then we'll narrow back down at, at to 20 at that intersection. And then similarly, immediately to the west of that, we had shown that previously as a 20 foot wide width also. Um, <clears throat> trail alignment has been slightly adjusted. Um, I'll look at this and we'll look at this in some more detail, but. Um, to address some of the comments and concerns previously, um, we have some made some adjustments to the um, to the multi-use trail. Um, we'll also go through some uh, porch options that we've um, we've submitted uh, to go along with the, the residential um, single-family homes um, in um, in compliance with the design standards. <clears throat> um, and then, lastly, on these on the latest set of plans, there's also a limit of work line that I think was something that was expressed. Um, that wanted to be seen on these plans is so on the erosion control plans on this final set there is a there is a limit of disturbance line um, so there's a lot of vegetation that we aren't uh, we aren't disturbing <clears throat> um, so again just looking at the lots real quick this will give you an idea of how you know where the significant changes are those the two um, the two large ones in the center contain five duplexes each the large one um, in the, in the north there is is also another five duplex uh, lot now so that that's what 
uh, brought us to the 29 lots as opposed to the, um, the previous number. Um, Unitypes, again, this, these haven't changed significantly from uh, what we looked at before. It's still the same mix <coughs> of family homes, same mix of duplexes, number of duplexes, co-housing units. are still the same number of buildings. Just a couple of those uh, larger footprint single-story buildings are now duplex units. Um, we've gotten three additional units as a result of just switching out some footprints for, for a home that's, you know, uh, instead of one story. We're still 32 units. 32 units. So still 85 units total. Right. That hasn't changed. The thir 32 co-housing units. Co units, right, yeah. right. That number, the overall number hasn't changed. Yeah. Uh, road cross-section, again, this, um, I left these in just in case this came up for discussion. Um, again, we're proposing roadside swales in conformance with the new design <coughs> standards. We have, uh, we've already gotten a, a stormwater permit from DPW, have worked out many of the details that uh, they had or questions that they had with regards to the way these operate. Um, we have done additional borings um, following our last meeting um, to confirm groundwater depths and consistency of soils. Um, I've, I've, Carolyn and DPW both got a copy of those boring logs, but generally they were consistent with what we found. I think the only location that they noted being some inconsistencies was up at the intersection where the co-housing road drives down that there's a little bit of variance in the type of soils there. So. So the recommendation was to increase the base, the road base depth there to 24 inches. And um, so that's, that's all been incorporated. Um, <clears throat> single family homes, again, um, I won't rehash a lot of what was talked about before, but one of the big comments was in regards to porches um, and the design standards. Um, so what we are proposing um, as part of this is we've got um, a selection of porches and um, porticos that are applicable to many of the homes in different locations. And I can walk you through the plan to show you where they occur, but essentially there's, there's a full front porch um, option. There's also options for a smaller porch in some of the units um, that you know, isn't, a, isn't a full porch. They've all got porches. If you look at the site plan, um, let's go back so you can... One more. Um, so if you look at a lot of these buildings, the ones that have a full porch have a six by nine porch on the side. There's ones that have a five by seven porch in both locations, um, but they all conform to the design standards. And um, as we mentioned last time, part of, you know, part of this project, unlike, uh, not unlike any of the other projects here, is we fully anticipate there's going to be some additional changes as buyers come on board um, and as these get developed. So we'll certainly be back to you as, you know, some of these changes happen. But um, initially, these are the house types and the options that we're proposing, at least to um, bring it into compliance with the design standards um, for, the, for the development. Um, so these are just some of the architectural uh, elevations and drawings for, for some of those porches. Um, and again, the co-housing really hasn't changed significantly. The one major change, I guess, from a site perspective is that southern, um, southern portion of the development used to have two sidewalks, two parallel sidewalks on either side um, in the interest of, you know, gaining some green space and, and you know, really having a, an additional walk there that really wasn't needed. That's been revised to show a, a single walkway, um, you know, a single walkway spine that, that goes from north to south rather than the, um, than the, than the two sidewalks. Jeff, um, again, Jeff, while you're on that slide, can, can you describe the width of that, is, of uh, that one sidewalk? So the main sidewalk down the center is five feet wide. All the all the smaller ones that lead directly to the units are four feet, and then there's a 12 foot emergency, you know, the 12 foot emergency access um, drive um, is visible there also. So the one that goes east west is 12 feet. Yeah, the big one is 12 feet wide for emergency, right? And we did review this with uh, Chief Nichols. Um, same with the co-housing or the duplex revisions and access via that common drive and he was fine with um, that access uh, and hydrant locations and any of the other concerns that, that he had. So um, again, the same, generally the same mix um, of housing types. 
um, for the co-housing. Um, no real significant changes other than, um, like I said, swapping out a few units um, for another type, but the, the elevations and the building types were, are all consistent with, with what we presented to you before. Um, and I think lastly, I'll just <coughs> on the trail connections and the discussions that have ensued since, um, since our last meeting. Um, we've had, um, we had a site visit with some of the residents, um, Carter, myself, um, Carolyn was out there and just looking at, you know, some of the concerns and some of the issues. Um, one of them was the notion that we were um, going through that main, that main field um, and not, um, it was being a lot more disruptive than, um, than what we could have done. So it's, it's tough to distinguish in this slide, but essentially right right around in this location here where we veer off of the existing paved trail. There's a small grove of trees. Um, there's probably half a dozen or eight mature trees that were there during the original state hospital. Most of the other growth in there are, consists of um, um, burning bush. Um, there's a lot of Norway maples. There's a lot of scrub and invasive stuff that's come in. But there's very clearly a, a, a path that can be taken through that that um, that clump of vegetation there, um, and it's it's in this picture. It's really that clump in the in that center um, panorama, that clump on the left hand side there in the distance. But it's um, there's a there's a very easy way to get a trail from the existing trail up to where we want to come out in this meadow and across um, where we enter the forest again under those beech trees. Um, that um, avoids skirting right next to that detention basin. There's minimal disturbance to the vegetation in there, at least in terms of the, the mature, you know, valuable uh, plant material that's there. Stuff that would need to be cleared would be the, um, the like I said, the invasive stuff. Um, but it, um, it provides a much better wooded connection than, you know, what we had before. The alternative would be to go up to the north and then wrap back down to the south, which just from a walking standpoint didn't you know the, the trail was 20 feet feet to your left and why go 50 feet out of your way and come back and then go north again so this seemed like an amenable solution that everybody um, seemed to agree upon so that's um, that was one of the changes in addition to the separation of the multi-use trail to the north of the co-housing drive um, getting it out from the, the vehicle circulation paths and making that a dedicated multi-use trail that would continue to the north and, and connect to the existing trail system. Um, and then lastly, um, trying to connect the multi-use path with the gravel path, the existing gravel path on the north side of the development. <coughs> um, there was um, a keen interest to maintain some sort of, um, you know, wooded uh, hiking trail along the eastern side of the property. Um, and we looked at several options, um, one of being, one of which was keeping the trail pretty much parallel with the property line that extends um, to the north up to the Smith property. Um, and I've walked that a couple times. And what, what I found was that it's, it's, you can't really tell in this picture, but there's this, there's these, um, three or four drumlins, for lack of better words, where the hillside extends out into that slope and drops down and then comes up again. So there's three or four of them in, in concession. In, um, um, so say, thank you. <laughs> As you move to the north. Um, and there's a very distinct delineation. You can see in this picture. So the top two images are
um, public trails on, on that piece of property. There is no development that can happen there. Um, it is essentially conservation land. I don't know whether it's covered in, under an easement, but um, it seemed like that was the very logical location that that trail would want to be. So I think, you know, as part of this project, <coughs> we're willing to um, propose a connection or at least, a, you know, the start of a trail to get beyond our, beyond the Village Hill property itself. But once we get onto the Village Hill property um, or onto the Smith property, um, you know, it, a, an agreement's got to be worked out with Smith if they want to develop it um, with, you know, gravel or, you know, somehow, um, you know, reinforce it somehow. But there certainly seems like there's um, an avenue to do that. Um, and as, as part of this project, as I said, we're willing to, you know, set the stage and, and start that trail. And, um, you know, part of the thought process and discussion has been that, you know, it's, it's the type of trail that I think would um, would merit flagging in the field and you could possibly just rake back some of the the duff in the you know in the forest floor to really get an understanding of where people want to go and you know what what that trail wants to be and where it wants to be before making any final um, decisions in terms of improvements but it's certainly something that um, you know I think is um, is something that's desirable on, on you know, in everybody's behalf, um, and this just seemed like the, the logical place to do it, the most sensible place to do it. Um, and I don't know whether you want to go through DPW comments. Uh, <coughs> we did get just a sort of the course of events. So we'd gotten the the initial uh, comment letter from DPW at the first hearing. Um, talked through some of the items. We submitted sort of a. a, a preliminary set of plans for them to review um, on um, the 19th of uh, November just to gauge you know their reaction in terms of how we address some of the stuff and whether they felt that we addressed it adequately it wasn't a full set of plans it was um, 10 or 11 sheets that contained the meat of you know where their comments were um, there were some typographical comments and you know um, things like that so we didn't produce a full set of plans for them to comment on, but we did get their comments back based on that plan set, um, have incorporated those into, um, into this final set. Um, and I've, I gave Carolyn tonight, you know, our, our formal responses to all those comments, really most of which they have already seen. Um, there's a number of places in their comment letter that they note that they haven't seen um, you know, they haven't seen the plans yet to be able to um, sign off on it yet. Um, I'm more than happy to walk through those changes or those requests with you, but um, most, as I said, most of them are, are fairly minor in nature. Um, so I can, I don't know how you want to deal with those, but. Um, the sheets you give them include all of the sewer and groundwater? So all, they've got all that information. The only, <coughs> the only item that's left sort of hanging is, um, they had asked for us to, and understandably, they had asked for us to update the overall sewer and water demand flows for um, the project at full build. You know, basically with this with this project. Um, and so what what happened is we had gotten um, the the spreadsheet that had been used to date uh, from Gale Associates, who had been doing all the calculations. We started to plug in our numbers, and as a result, noticed that there were some errors in those spreadsheets. Um, and um, there was a difference in the way that the original EIR had calculated flows versus the way that the spreadsheet calculated. It was 100 gallons versus 110 gallons. There was an assumption about um, the assisted, assisted living uh, aspect of it. Those numbers made a big change in the, in the calculations. Um, subsequently, there was also a notice of project changed for the EIR that was filed um, in 2010. Um, it was a uh, report done by Epsilon and Tie and Bond, which increased the overall demand at full build from 98,000 gallons to 104,000 gallons. The one piece, the one missing link in that was that the DPW needs to, needed to write a letter agreeing with that number and verifying that they had the capacity to accommodate those flows, and that never letter that letter never got written. So we've been going back and forth with the DPW and Dave Valletta and he, you know, we gave him all the information and, and data that we've collected and sort of, you know, distilled it down. 
and he seemed to agree that the 104,000 gallon number is a legitimate number. They don't have any concerns about it. We just need to spend a little bit of time updating the spreadsheet and correct some of the previous errors that we had pointed out. Um, but we're still under, um, well under that 104, and there's still enough room based on our calculations now for any future development, i.e. the Bacoy project um, or any other you know, projects that are left undeveloped there. So I think <coughs> at the end of the day, that 104,000 gallons is going to be fine. We just need to go back and, and tweak the spreadsheets a little bit so that everybody is, you know, on board. But that um, that's the one item that we, you know, weren't able to close out necessarily. Okay. I think that's... <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Questions? Just a, a quick question. On the, on the yield streets where it, you go from 20 feet, it's supposed to go... They go to 20 feet wide for 30 feet. In mm -hmm. this case, you're going instead of 30 feet to that first driveway in two areas. What is the distance of that first driveway, roughly? Um, is it within shouting distance of 30 feet? 20, 25 feet. Yeah, the one, the one on the west side. Um, it's probably not. It's probably closer to 15 feet, um, given that the driveway and Ford Crossing are at least 50 feet apart. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, we showed it for the first segment because I, I guess from a, an engineering and a traffic perspective that where it made sense, it didn't seem to do it, it didn't seem to make sense to continue it up to, you know, mid block or mid, you know, mid driveway. Um, and that that was a very easy, um, you know, place to make that adjustment and would make sense in terms of vehicular circulation and access. <clears throat> We also try to keep the, the, the narrowing consistent as you drive around the development. So it's, it's on, the, you know, on the left side, um, you know, or at least on the same side as, as the other ones that were proposed. <clears throat> when you were here the last time on the, what would be the lower left-hand side of, um, of the plat, mm -hmm. there's a small park in that area that we had a discussion about access to. Um, it, you, we, there was a, a path that went through some of the lower left-hand side between houses there trying to reach. Is that the Pecoy development? It wasn't this one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think you're, I think All right. you're right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sorry. No, it's fine. Yeah, I think I'll just point out quickly, too, because I don't think I mention this either. In addition to that multi-use trail on the north side being all on um, the, the part of the contiguous property that would be to the north, but also that southerly section, um, there's now a property line that takes <coughs> space between the single family homes on the east side of Olander and the co-housing, so where you see those large, those large trees in the center there. That's, um, you can see the property line, it, it basically parallels the parking lot on the left and then cuts down at an angle to the, you know, to the southeast and then across. So all of that land is also going to be part of that um, land that's deeded to the city for open space. So all of all of the multi-use trail will be on, on city property. So I want to pick back up where Mark was asking about the width of the street. You sort of presented the traffic calming as either raised speed tables or narrowing of the street. Was there any conversation about doing both? Um, there wasn't a conversation about doing both, no. I think the issue was if they were asking for a waiver from narrowing the street, that there should be something else that creates that, um, you know, that reduction mm -hmm. in speed. And one of the alternatives was potentially a, um, a speed table or a raised intersection or something. Carol, last time we talked a lot about who was going to own the streets, and if I understood correctly, now the city is going to own the path that bisects this property. What, if any, impact? I mean, what responsibilities will the city have about the path? The well. Um, <clears throat> Once this, um, as any of the other paths in the city, if the city takes um, ownership, which we're, um, from our department's perspective, is fine. It's, it's great. It's sort of the better, the most ideal situation. So it would just be, we'd want to make sure that it was, um, 
you know, constructed to a standard that would be um, um, be able to be easily maintained over the long haul, which typically means we need, um, you know, root barriers, which I think is already in the detail for that because that's what we require anyway, even if it's not on city property. But um, there's no, if you're talking about snow maintenance or obligation, we would treat it like any other bike pass section. If at the, if there's some point in the future where the city decided that they're, the city's going to plow all the trails, then only at that point would this be maintained during the winter. Um, but there wouldn't, um, the only ones that we're doing now are the main, you know, robotic and um, I don't even think we're going down this way yet. So. You get to the intersection down there, I think. Don't we go behind the brewery? That gets, that gets yeah. But not beyond. So, and this is a spur. It's not the main, you know, system. So I can't imagine that we'd be anywhere near maintaining this in the winter for years. Mark? There were a number of waivers that were requested, several of which have been recommended by staff before the public is involved. Carolyn, you maybe walk us through and give us like an abridged overview. <coughs> Sure. Um, so um, there are a number of waivers that were really about the timing of um, submission of materials. So the um, ones that both DPW and Planning Office are um, both recommend for approval relates to the um, um, hydrology study that's um, typically submitted at. at um, you know, the front end, so um, that one, DPW had no problem with. Water study <coughs> for flow analysis was done um, at the beginning, uh, sort of as part of the whole build out of the subdivision. So in a normal sub, in, a di in another type of subdivision where it's just um, a discrete piece of property, um, we would normally require that, but this has been done sort of outside of this project. <laughs> Same with the traffic study um, that was done as part of the um, <coughs> big picture um, build out of the state hospital. Um, and then the, another uh, a waiver that was requested and we're, we're supportive of is uh, that the restrictive covenants language be um, submitted um, um, prior to endorsement instead of at the subdivision approval. I think there's some language about the covenants, um, but really it makes more sense to look at it before endorsement because then it includes any conditions that might come as part of the planning board um, decision anyway. Um, and ecological assessments are typically done as part of subdivision. This was done again as part of that big MEPA process and overall state hospital uh, build out process. <coughs> the next one, um, number six I have on here is for um, street crossings with a crosswalk every 200 feet when there's an area where you don't have concrete sidewalks on both sides of the street and that's in to support low impact um, development and design criteria. So DPW was recommending against crosswalks, made block crosswalks and um, th as an alternative they've done some street narrowing to s sort of create the same effect of slowing traffic so it's safe for people to cross back and forth if they're done walking on gravel and they want a steady surface or they never wanted to be on gravel they can get to the um, steady surface pretty easily. Um, provision of bus shelter uh, for this whole project, the bus shelter site has already been identified at the corner of Village Hill Road and Prince Street. Um, school department wanted it there, agreed with the original, you know, when the first subdivision for this came in, that's the one for the project, so that's where that is. <coughs> um, and then the waiver for the tree protection for all trees um, over 20-inch um, caliper. I'll have to remember the details of that. Can you fill that in, um, Jeff? That was just that you had that I think basically is there's a variation based on tree species. Right. Well, and so we <coughs> obviously we've identified the, the key specimen trees and, and noted you know, particular attention to those and protecting those. There are several other trees on the site um, that have grown up since you know, the original state hospital. You know, there's uh, most notably down in where the co-housing portion is. Um, 
that you know will need to be cleared as you know just, just to make way for the project. They were never. Um, I think they were cataloged in some of the original tree inventory and have now you know grown up to be 20 inch you know caliper trees. Um, I don't think, at least talking with um, the arborists that we've had out there, any of them are really notable. I mean, again, it's most of this, most of the stuff that's grown in since um, the hospital, state hospital was disbanded, was you know, is, is invasive stuff. It's it's a lot of um, it's a lot of Norway maple. Um, it's a lot of um, there's some black locusts. There's some other trees, but um, most of the other vegetation, significant vegetation, existing vegetation, is all um, being protected. You know that. That um, area just south of um, the co-housing <coughs> use trail comes up um, that I was referring to before the city property, and we're not going to do any <coughs> work in there at all. Um, same with all the um, land to the north above, um, you know, where the where the single-family homes are. None of that's going to be disturbed. Um, and I think this is different than other subdivisions as well because we had that pre-cataloging of the really. Um, great specimen trees and so the, per, the effort in this case which is why we uh, you know recommend um, the waiver is that um, there are some significant trees that they are protecting that were always impo considered important from the beginning of this um, evaluation for the redevelopment um, then there's a, another tree waiver that um, the for reduction for the caliper of new plantings for the street trees um, that would be uh, two inch instead of three inch upon planting <coughs> and, um, it's just for those smaller um, trees that would be planted um, versus the taller trade shade trees so the smaller trees are the ones they're planting in order to um, still enable uh, um, access um, so um, we don't at a staff level have an issue with with that um, on that same note DPW did raise a concern about the type of hawthorn that was picked in terms of the amount of fruit that it might produce mm -hmm. um, so um, I think you know I would recommend that um, uh, and typically there is um, flexibility because we have a whole list of street trees in different categories. So even though there's some trees on plants, some trees <coughs> get changed um, through the course, we can always come back and check in. If DPW feels really strong about one tree, there are other options for the applicant to pick. So. Right. And I'll just, I do just want to point out that the, <coughs> the, the trees that we are showing um, to preserve the solar access are from the list of street trees that was recommended in the subdivision standard. So there were there's three trees that are you know that are in lieu of the larger trees. There's there's a kusa dogwood, there's a hawthorn, and a crab apple. And so our initial response to DPW was that well you know we've got the other trees also, but they all have fruit. Um, so you know we we're utilizing the the full list that was available. Right. But if there's other options that are amenable to everybody, I don't think there's any objection. To, to varying species at all so um, and then the final one on this list so far and this you know the board you know, may choose others um, that um, the manholes and catch basins are would be um, HDPE material instead of precast concrete um, for the vegetated swales and so they're just treated differently different material um, for that and TPW didn't have a problem with that um, I think think we would still need to add a waiver about the street um, width um, to that list because uh, for the length the dimension length so mm -hmm. um, Jeff noted that on the west side the width of 20 feet only goes about 15 feet instead of the 30 feet so that would technically be a waiver so I'd want to make sure that that get wrapped in to the list so that it's clear <laughs> Um, what's the dimension on the east side, the length of the 20-foot width? That's probably closer to 30 feet. Okay. Yeah. So, um... The road's 24 feet wide, so just looking at the scale, I would guess it's at least, yeah, 25, 30 feet. Okay, so it would technically still be a waiver if it's less than 30. <laughs> um, so you might want to say 25 
it has to be a length of at least 25 feet on that east side if you want, because I think the waiver needs to be very specific about what it's allowing. Um, there are a few that um, DPW recommended for not approving, um, but I think those have all been addressed. This um, sewer study, um, Jeff described that they were going through that process with DPW and they've ironed out the last little details of that. Will there be a letter? <coughs> well, there has to be. So um, in order for the DPW to grant approval, for a sewer, um, then um, they have to sign off on it. So it's it's really um, the design, they won't be able to move forward until they show that the design flows are being um, met. Is there still, though, a missing action on the city's part to have written a letter in history that should have straightened out the? There might have been. That's a DPW um, item, so I, I didn't check in with DPW to see, but to close that loop. I mean, we need that anyway to make sure that all the I's are dotted and T's crossed. So on our end, do we even need to make that a qualification where it can't go forward no. without it so we don't yeah. right? Right. Um, and then the stormwater pollution prevention plan. Um, so there's still... there. A, their, the applicant is going to be submitting that before right. construction, so that's not really an issue. I think DPW highlighted that initially because they hadn't seen it yet, and they wanted to make you know flag it to make sure that it didn't get lost in the. <coughs> but that again is another requirement. I mean, beyond just local right. permitting, that has to be done. So um, I don't think you know we need to name that. Um, and. Um, then there's a f technically, I think the um, easements for the infrastructure, they're 30 feet wide in the public right of way, correct? But not in the private, on the private side? They are, well, so the only easements that we ended up with, um, one, of the, one of the major, <coughs> to eliminate a few is the combining of the uh, duplex lots. But, DPW requested 15-foot-wide uh, easements over the um, forced uh, private sanitary mains that cross Olander in a couple locations. Those have been added to the plans. Um, we've added other sanitary easements for the any of the pump service, um, you know, ejector pump um, sewer. The one that we weren't able to, and we, you know, we went around with them the first go around with this. Um, they were requesting a 30-foot wide easement for the drainage line that ran, you know, between the duplex lots um, or across. Actually, it's 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 an easement for them to convey water from the the west side of Olander through the um, through the duplexes and the single-family homes, and then down. <coughs> Cutting, cutting across the east side of Olander and down the hill to the detention basin. They had wanted a 30-foot wide easement for, for that 12-inch drain line, and we don't have 30 feet of you know, width between the units. Um, and they really, the, the easement um, was, is really just for the conveyance of stormwater. They're not going to own, they're not going to own the pipe. They're not going to own any of the infrastructure. They just wanted an easement to convey city water in, in Olander, which is a city street across private property, and then, you know, continue on. Um, and that a 15-foot width, as you know, as we explained to them, is more than enough room to replace, repair a 12-inch, you know, drain pipe if that's what's needed. So we, we, you know, we centered it, um, the easement, one of the other requests um, on that drain line. But that, you know, we've provided as, as wide an easement as we can along there. And DPW is fine with that. And they're fine with that. Yeah. So that I think that's that it. We need yeah, so officially you would say you're allowing a 15-foot wide um, um, drain easement in lieu of the 30-foot wide standard because it's crossing private property. They've addressed a number of the other comments and, and a lot of the 
notes we have from the previous meeting are from the public comments from before, so maybe we should hear from them again and see what we can cross off. Going once. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, move we open public comment. Yes, sir, welcome. My name is John Brady. I'm 85 Olander Drive. Uh, we had a commu community meeting um, earlier this week, uh, and there was a, a, a letter to you after, after that meeting. The residents are, th this is a big project uh, to us uh, because uh, adding 85 homes and you know, two or 300 people and a lot of cars. So we're just, we, we want it to work out well for, for quality of life. We do think that the uh, EPH uh, folks have been uh, responsive uh, to our previous comments and, and, and a number of the things that were in our letter have been responded to and what they've, what they've done this <coughs> evening. Um, I want to speak first about, about trails. Can, can we move to that one with the red lines on it? There we go, that's good. Uh, so um, we think that the, the trails on this, on this map look good. The, uh, the two uh, multi-use trails, the, the blue multi-use trail uh, is, is, is important. And uh, there, we did have some discussion in the field about how we, how we got from the current multi-use trail um, across uh, a, a nice open field there by the upper detention pond. Um, we, we talked about different ways of doing that, uh, and uh, uh, this this way is it. Some people like uh, the the more serpentine way. Uh, other people like, um, but uh, it, we do think that it's a, that it's a good connection and it is an improvement. Uh, the part that goes under the the beech trees there, we're we're just worried about those trees and making sure that the. Uh, they did propose a boardwalk, and that maybe the the footings that are in there be be done be done carefully. The idea that uh, I talked about at the last meeting was: can we have a way to walk in the woods around and not have to go through uh, the the development? Because the previous master plans, all of them showed a a path along the east side that you could walk through that was sort of outside the buildings. Um, the plan that's that's proposed here, we think, is fine. That is, it goes. Uh, it's a nice route through the woods. It requires some work to do, and we have to work with Smith College to do that. Uh, but I, th I think it's a good solution, uh, and we appreciate the, uh, the the proposal, and we're willing to to work to make that come out well. I think everybody will will like that. Um, we noticed that there there is also the the trail on the west west side. So it's the red line that comes around up on the outside. Um, and we just we, we think that the plan shows that 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 will be there and 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 uh, maybe even improved from the 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 design and uh, and we appreciate that and, and hope that that goes forward. We are worried, and this will be be future uh, again. How does that move through the Picoy development uh, as it goes? But the original plan has always had two multi-use trails going to the north, uh, and we we hope that that will uh, that that will work out. Uh, the traffic is also a, a concern to us, and uh, in our um, because there will be a lot of cars. Uh, one of the things that we thought could be helpful would be uh, uh, to uh, uh, have the traffic calming measures that that, that you've uh, been discussing, uh, but also perhaps to rename uh, the loop uh, that's up there to the north. It's a little bit confusing. Uh, the o Olander has many entrances, and and um, we can imagine we can imagine delivery trucks going around in different ways. And we think that if it is that northern loop is is renamed to be a different a different street, uh, that it would be to to the advantage of everyone. Uh, we suggested Higgins Way as being a mayor that's been involved, um, but it, it doesn't matter to us. We just think that it should be something different, something loop, something uh, that, that conveys that. Um, we wonder about, we also wonder about parking and with all the cars uh, that will be associated with this, um, uh, where, where does the parking go? The on-street parking uh, as, it's, as it stands can be either side, could be both sides, and in which case the road gets really narrow. 
uh, and we're a little worried about that. We, we think that, that that should be given some thought <coughs> in advance and maybe at least limit it to one side, uh, that that would, would be better. Um, uh, th those, were, those were concerns that we all, we all talked about. We're a little worried about the traffic, uh, overall traffic, and how does that uh, affect the, uh, the entrance and exit to Village Hill, and how, how will that go when we have all these new cars? Uh, so that's something that, that worries folks, and which way will those cars go? Yeah. Um, I think the trail is a great improvement. I really do, and I'm, I think you can feel like they heard you on that. Um, I, I would speak to the parking just because that's something that the traffic issues are what I worry about. And, you know, one of the classic traffic calming measures is to actually do the parking on either side alternately because it, it slows down the through traffic because they have to keep looking at which side and where to go. So in some ways, the, the, the need for parking on the street is going to work in your favor as far as the speed of the traffic. And so necking that down at different intersections and giving people different places to park, I think is really a good solution. Um, I, I, I know we did the parking, did the traffic study early on, and it was done for the full build out of the hill. So we know that traffic is always the problem and concern. Um, we feel like you know, we got the technical answer through that study early on, and it looked at this kind of density on the hill. So I, I understand it, it's the concern. I, I live on a street where two cars can't go down, you know, the different ways. So any other comments or responses? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Next. <coughs> yes, sir. <coughs> Hi, Jonathan Wright, um, 91 Olander Drive which is a real address. Um, <coughs> two doors up from, from John Brady. I don't know whether you, I, I sent in some comments December 6th, which you have. <coughs> um, I, I, there was quite a, a, a difference of view about this area behind uh, the detention basin as to whether it was worth, uh, in fact, Carolyn, you know, questioned the uh, ripping through 100 feet of that buffer um, instead of going around it. And I, I, don't, I don't really have an answer for why it's a better idea to tear it up than go around it. It's more circuitous, but you know, actually, for people who are walking or riding or skating, a curvilinear path is very nice. It doesn't make that much difference to us because all of that past asphalt is right behind our house anyway. It's just that um, even as late as last week, we saw a red fox in that border, which is where you know, this is proposed to be cut through diagonally. So I don't, I don't think that that's the right solution, but it is what it is. I um, wanted to go down for, through a couple of these other items as well, um, in no particular order. The, the tree caliper thing is a little bit, there are species which can be more mature and have sufficient caliper so that they provide shade without blocking solar. Um, the idea that by having smaller caliper trees, which are cheaper, you protect solar, you're just changing the time frame. So it's about the species, and I'm not sure really you should be allowing, we know what two, two inch caliper trees look like on the streets in subdivisions around America, and that's not what's been done up there, and that's not what people expect. So I think you should take a close look at that. I wanted to come to the, the um, as you come into Village Hill now, you can take a right on Olander Drive, you can come up to the end of Village Hill, take a right on Ford Crossing, you'll be able to take a left on Olander Drive. You go to the end of it, take a left on Olander Drive, and take a right on Olander Drive. This same strategy was used for Mosier Street, which has turned out to be a disaster. You can see the poor, uh, you know, Sears man driving in his van in circles looking for where the beginning and the end and which goes up and down. So I would add my voice very strongly to making it Higgins Circle. Also, the word drive uh, reflects is hardly a new urbanism concept. It's a sort of a suburban concept. And there's a great deal about this plan, which is a fairly conventional suburban layout, but drive is not really how we want to describe the um, work. We're fine with the way Olander Drive is now. It's a city street, but 
we think that's kind of a, a, a something that ought to be looked at. Um, I wanted to comment on the traffic comment. I, I, I understand that, uh, Madam Chairman, your view. Um, however, a 24-foot wide curved road, um, <coughs> when you need six and a half feet to park a car, and with vertical uh, granite curbs, which tear up your tires and your wheels, people will park away from them. You cannot get a fire truck through if there are cars on both sides. And we're looking at eight to 10 years of construction with construction trucks. It's not going to work. And people, it's also unsafe because people back out of their driveways and there's no way to turn. If you go to Mosier Street now in Pecois, it doesn't work. People cannot get out of their driveways. So you really need to look at that. I understand it is calming, but, uh, uh, and, and that's fine. We're not looking for a wider road. We're all saying is it, an engineer should decide where it's possible to park safely and delineate that and mark it as opposed to letting it uh, be kind of free form. Um, delighted to hear that there was new drainage work done. Uh, so that's, that item is taken care of itself. The drainage swales, um, who's going to maintain those, those low impact development? Is DPW going to take care of those when people drive on them or whatever happens to them? Um, they need to be cleaned out. The tree belt in front of most houses is the responsibility of the homeowner that abuts it. So are these pieces of infrastructure the homeowner's responsibilities? I think that should be made clear. Um, <coughs> uh, I'm going to talk about the sequence of construction work here in a minute. Can I tell you about that? Oh, on the architecture stuff, I did confirm with Mass Development that both the Beals and Thomas uh, design guidelines and the CBT residential <coughs> guidelines are enforced and they are enforcing them. Porches are not optional. And I'm frankly I'm getting a little tired of having to come and tell you that boxes without porches with optional porches do not meet the design guidelines. That's not what people um, expect. So the porches are part of the integral social fabric of a new urbanist development. They're not optional. Mass Development admits that they missed it on Pecois buildings and don't do it again, please. Please, please enforce those and see that they do get enforced. Me, Jonathan, just to follow yeah. up on that, I thought, uh, and Jeff, you can speak to that, that you're not saying that the porches are optional on this. You said there were porch no. options. I, there's options, but, but they all have a, a porch. porch that okay, because the, the, the illustrations that were presented don't yeah. have porches on them. The presentation we saw tonight, though, they all did. They were, um, if you look, well, right. right. So you're saying that this, they will all have either the 5 by 7 or the 6 right. by 9. Right. Right. So that's, it's really hard to keep up with the submissions because. All main entrances. So every yeah. unit right. That's great. Right. That's great. Good for you. Okay. Um, I want to just make a couple of comments about the context of the master plan. And we've been told um, that, you know, the number of units is a done deal. But I want you to be aware that for seven years, mass development has published a plan that shows 45 units. And a quarter of a billion dollars has been invested at Village Hill, 90% of it privately, based on that master plan. So the city has the right under the new subdivision to make it to double the size of that. It doubles the number of cars and it doubles the length of construction. So for those of us who live there, a five-year development is now an eight to 10-year development. I'll be 76 years old when this finishes. So it's not just what you have the right to do, it's what's right for the people who have made Village Hill what it is. If a project at the dead end, excuse me, the project at, a, at, at the end of an existing residential development anywhere in the city came in and they said, for as long as we can remember, we've told you this, now it's going to be twice that. I ask you, what would the response be? There would be hell to pay. So the fact that it can happen does not mean that it should happen. I realize it's going to happen, but I'm going to make some requests here to make the project uh, uh, more survivable for those of us who bought into something that was quite different. And um, let me just suggest those things to you. Um, and as an example, behind where we live, uh, there were eight co-housing units shown on the master plan, and they're now 32. So that is a that's, you know, there's a misrepresentation, and whether it's legally, you know, I'm, 
We're not going to go to the Supreme Judicial Court to find out, but it's, it's, a, it's a disappointment. Um, so let me just come back to, to um, another piece here. So far, all the infrastructure has been built at public expense, and um, the infrastructure was built, and then the homes were built. So essentially, other than the experience that we had for 13 months of Ford Crossing being built and you know, having our house sandblasted by blowing dirt, um, everyone has been free of that. But now we're going to have a four sections of road construction. So in four years, we're going to have major road construction happening upwind of us. And I would like to suggest that, uh, as one of the conditions for this project, that that be consolidated into two bills. Um, I'd like to ask that uh, some very careful signage be given so that <coughs> when you come into Village Hill and uh, there's a sign that says, you know, that um, you can access the co-housing by turning right, but that the main entrance for the other phases is, in fact, off of Village Hill Road, which is intended to be the <coughs> spine. Um, the road name changing would also help, I think, uh, with that directional uh, indication. Um, there's some other things that uh, are good practice. Um, this road, road, road work will be done not under the supervision of the DPW and uh, by a private contractor. And we're not clear what the communication method is if there are issues there. When road work has been done in the past, there's been a, uh, a residence and contractors group that met every two weeks. And we need some place to go when there's a problem with uh, mud, siltation, uh, working hours too early, um, other, other kinds of things. We'd like to request specifically that all, uh, as is required by the LEED program, that all open uh, piles of uh, fill be covered and ballasted at night. This is the, probably the windiest place in the city of Northampton, and stuff blows around. Um, and, uh, you know, we've had our summers of not being able to open our windows, and frankly, want to be sure that we don't have that for the next 10 years. Um, so condense the road construction into two phases instead of uh, four. And um, hmm. um, be clear about when the multi-use trails are going to be built. We'd like to suggest that this new spine um, that's going up through here, um, even though it's between phase one and phase three, be completed as part of um, phase one uh, so that that access which we currently have is maintained throughout the construction process prior to the issuance of occupancy permits for phase one. Then on the left side, and I'm, I'm not sure that this is really a citizen's responsibility to, to work this out, but I have to tell you on the left side that before there's any occupancy on phase two, that that trail be in place, because we have use of it now, and uh, we'd like to have continued use of it during construction. And so that's often been required. You know, you have to get this sidewalk in or that path before in the <coughs> phasing. So those are my main, main comments. Uh, directional signage uh, that's permanent that's welcoming, that directs people in the, in the correct order, um, and also that for construction purposes that other than phase one and co-housing that all construction traffic be specifically required to go down Village Hill Road and access from that side. <coughs> and if it continues to be all Olander Drive, it's all going to come down Olander Drive. And, uh, oops, excuse me. I don't think that's the, <coughs> it's a narrower street. It's an unlined street, and I don't think that was the intention there. So we love the idea of Higgins Way or Higgins Circle. That seems, seems like a, a, good, a good approach. So I think that's all I have. And <coughs> Jonathan? Yes, sir. <coughs> what, moving the traffic to Village Hill Road and <coughs> instead of Olander, wouldn't that just impact a different group of people? Um, well, right now, if, if the address is Olander Drive, then all of the traffic will come on the side street. And the the center. Olander uh, Drive. You mean the, the, that's a side street. Side street. So Village Hill Road is a larger street. It is. It has uh, <coughs> on street parking on both sides. It's a wider street. It's a lined street. And but in uh, terms of impact, does that make any difference? It's a it, width of the street. Well, 
what I'm what I'm asking is for construction purposes that the half of the of the construction uh, is proximal to Olander Drive, moves Olander Drive, and the other part, which is not, not moves Olander Drive. And that's a that's a naming, but also a signage question can easily address that. I mean, having lived there for four years and watched people wander around with GPS for you know for roads that are not on the GPS, yeah, it, run out and help them. Oh, we do all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Went where's 24 and a half Mosier Street? I don't know. Start this way and start that way and see where you get. Um. <coughs> okay. Any other questions for? <coughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. Appreciate it. Next. Yes. Please, sir. <coughs> well, I don't have any statistics um, or anything, but my name is Dolores, and I Dolores am currently here. Pardon? Last name, please. A-R-R-O-Y-O, -R -R -O, Arroyo. Thank okay. you. And I live here on, um, in Northampton on Harlow. And my husband and I moved to Northampton um, because we wanted to seriously explore becoming members of the Village Hill co-housing community. We came from Cape Cod, and I think <coughs> it's the best way to get to know not only um, meet people here in the community, but also to get to know the town, since I'm not from here. And, um, and so we came and began attending the meetings. And I just want to tell each and every one of you um, we've spent countless hours talking about how it is to be living together in a, this new model of living in co-housing. And there are so many beautiful places to hear in Northampton, but the reason we came here was because this is such an incredible movement in the country right now of how to live where the underlying core value is to be intentional neighbors with one another. And so we have basically stated our desire to um, be there for one another in like in that old town sort of fashion, old fashioned town community development, um, to practice deep listening when there's conflicts, um, to share common meals in the common house and activities in the common house, and also invite the wider community, not just this little enclave up there, that's not the purpose of the co-housing, but to invite the wider to community to share in whatever activities that we might think the town would enjoy. And so in spite of all the countless hours we've spent together, <coughs> um, we've also decided that we like one another. And that's kind of a, a, kind of a fun thing to, to know. So I'm really excited about living with folks who share this vision. And I know there are so many problems, there's so many things to work out. Um, but I'm really glad to hear about the communication that's taking place and the support that you all are showing as well in kind of entertaining this, this model. And I so. really appreciate Carter, and that's not just a pretty place to live, but it's also so environmentally responsible and sustainable, and how I want to live in my 90 plus years. So, thank you. Thank you. I hope you get all of them. <laughs> Two. <laughs> Next. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, David King, uh, resident on uh, Harlow Street. and. Just want to speak briefly about. Um, I know this land is going to be developed, and environmental concerns are really high, uh, highly important to me. And I just greatly appreciate that this is a low impact uh, development being considered, and also the uh, zero net energy uh, aspect of the homes. Um, I think it's just a tremendous model for developments anywhere in this country, and so. To put something out there, um, you know, that can be observed by other other developers, uh, I think, is a real important consideration, and so definitely in supportive of the project <coughs> um, for those reasons. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another speaker. Um, for close public comment? Maybe you can keep it open while we talk and okay. then in case something Yeah, that up. would be good. We'll go back and forth. Carolyn, can you speak to the, the width of the, the roads and, and possibly delineating where, not widening the roads, but showing where people should or shouldn't park instead of leaving it up to the residents to decide and, and <coughs> maybe impeding somebody backing out of their driveway or something like that? 
Yeah, I mean, most of the streets in the city are right. undelineated. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's it's not a model. It, it is <laughs> the right. way that it functions. Um, so I, you know, from my perspective, I don't really <coughs> need to do that. We've got um, lots of tight neighborhoods all over downtown that are even have narrower streets and lots more driveways. Um, and the parking is designated just by either side of the street or, you know, no parking from here to curb or what have you, and that's mm -hmm. it. So um, we certainly don't see a need to yeah. do that. So it wouldn't be ticketed if you parked to <coughs> the driveway because it's a private road, but the, the habits people would have for not parking too close to driveway should prevail is my expectation. Well, the, oh, the one, the, oh, the loop, well, is the anticipation is that they would come for public street acceptance. Um, and that's where we're talking about the street. So there are standards for driveways. So yes, you could be ticketed if you're blocking a driveway. Okay. Yeah. Um, Want to talk about the navigation problems of the naming of the street? <coughs> there, I, I could see uh, it's not something I experience, so I don't have that you know, that concern for it, but I can see a loop that comes off of a street and then you could go all the way down the other side. Could, if there's a way to simplify that, should we? I'm, yeah, I don't, I think simplification is keeping a name continuous when it crosses another street. I mean, there are lots of examples where you cross a street in New England or Northampton in particular where it changes names and that makes it more confusing <laughs> than anything else. But you could, instead of continuing Olander Drive, you could say Olander Loop or something like that. That would distinguish it as the end of the street that loops around. The planning board does have jurisdiction to name the street. Mm -hmm. Typically, you go off you know, what the applicant has suggested. Um, but there are times when an applicant suggests a street and it's a duplication of something else in town. So then the planning board says, no, let's do this other name. Mm -hmm. Um, ultimately, it's your authority to decide what that name is. So you can okay. name it Devon Way if you want or something like that. <laughs> I, I did have a little grin over Higgins Circle just because it begs for thinking about all of the circles. But, uh. <laughs> but I think when you have a continuation of a road, it just makes it more confusing if all of a sudden it changes names. Mm -hmm. Would it lend itself to the Village Hill traffic coming up on the left side of the neighborhood as opposed to always coming up Orlander Drive and then coming around? I think people are going to take the path of least resistance and wherever, whatever makes sense at that moment, they'll do. I think for construction traffic, you've got bigger trucks. The drivers are probably going to feel more comfortable taking a straight shot up Village Hill Road. Um, and, you know, it might take some time for all the Googles and other GPS systems to input the information about the <coughs> streets, but it'll be there. Yeah, I'm, I'm, the construction traffic, I think, will know what's the closest street for them, and the residents, I think, will funnel in and out on the most expeditious route. I, I guess I am somewhat wondering about the <coughs> delivery trucks, but they, um, I think they learn the area pretty well. I mean, I. I mean, I think it makes sense to have a directional sign for the co-housing at the at their private driveway, you know, off of Olander for sure. And um, in terms of, you know, construction directing construction traffic, that's just not an enforceable um, condition. And I think, you know, like I said, the the vehicles will go where. I always look to you to nod over that. Uh, well, I just wonder why it wouldn't be a, enforceable to, to require the developer to have a construction traffic plan or mitigation plan for. Um, you could say that, but you, the city can't go out and enforce it. Someone calls and says, hey, that driver just went up Olander instead of Village Hill. It's done. There's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> and I will say also in terms of construction, no matter who's de creating a street, there's always construction oversight. It's in the subdivision regulations. It doesn't matter whether it's a private developer or funded through public money with 
a quasi-private, quasi-public Even though mass not, development. we're not developing, they're, they're hiring subcontractors. Right, but it doesn't matter who's doing it, right? Mass development wasn't doing it. They hired a contractor. We have the same process <coughs> for oversight for engineers, um, construction and inspection, and reports to DPW. So that all stays the same no matter who's building the street. Yes, yes sir? Uh, possibility for clarification is to uh, have a numbering underneath the sign. You've seen that in places where you know one through fifty is this way, fifty you know fifty one through hundred is is mm -hmm. the other way. That may alleviate the concern. Of <coughs> Any other questions? Um, well, I'd like to know what the developer, the applicant, thinks about doing the road in two phases instead of four, as was suggested and also about covering the piles of construction dirt, which seems pretty yeah. easy to do. I, mean, I can speak to the construction piles. Um, I mean, it's, it's typically standard in the um, road control <coughs> and, you know, the, the, the NITES permit that will have to you know, file anyway um, requires you to cover all of that material, any stockpile material anyway. So but that will be done. It, that will be done by, yeah. What about the issue, other issue of when the roads will be constructed? That's, yeah. <laughs> that would be impractical with the uh, uh, land disposition agreement that we have with Mass Development. So we've structured everything from, from day one to have three different phases of the infrastructure on the <coughs> right away, and the co-housing being a fourth. You mean Mass Development would not agree to Facing the road differently. They want to get paid when they sell the land, so to make it financially feasible, we want to break it up into smaller pieces. So everything is revolved around doing things in sections. The big, the big issue is then that you know, for a developer to come in and buy all of the land and only and build all the public infrastructure, yet not have the ability to you know build or sell the homes yet, is 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 the issue. So that you know, you've got to. Can't extend yourself too far. Infrastructure, so it's a lot. It's a challenge. Mass development would not be a matter of <coughs> revising that in a way to make it possible to just do the roads, but not the other. Not if they don't get a construction built out. I'm so sorry. What? Mass, mass development wants to assure a successful project, so they want to. Um, they were happy with the four phases that we proposed. That would be, a, it would be a hardship to do it in two. Yeah. Just, I'd like to, if I could just comment about that. This, we've heard all along how it has to be the way mass development wants it to be. You know, my comments are about the quality of life that was presented by mass development to this community. And we're asking for some effort on the part of the developer. I don't really care if it's inconvenient. But what we want to be the fact that putting a sign up suggesting that construction traffic go a particular way, I'm not talking about enforceability, we're talking about removing confusion. It's such a simple thing. It just seems to be a reason why every um, possible accommodation, and these are tiny things, except for the road construction, are not necessary. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty discouraging to sit here and, and be told why these people who have lived there, I've sat on that porch for four years, I know exactly how the traffic works, and I know exactly the mistakes that people make. The people who live in Pico, I know exactly why the Mosher Street loop doesn't work. So it's hard to sit and have us told that it's not a problem. There's 350 people who are going to live up there. That's not Massasoit Street or Franklin Street. There are no other ways out. It's one way out. And if a, if a, if a tractor trailer truck coming around the tight end of that street has parked cars on both sides. What are they supposed to do when an ambulance comes up behind them? There's no place to go. And it seems like a, a pretty pretty uh, heavy lift to ask a neighbor um, to, to keep pressing on these points which seem to be public safety. Just, I, I, I don't understand the resistance to, to marking some parking and making it clear where you can park. And if people park someplace else, you know, we're not talking about ticketing. Right now, there are no no parking signs. There, there's none of that. It's just it's just 
and uh, we've, we've, we've been told if there's a problem, you'll come back later. That will reflect badly on the city and the planning board to come back and have to do it later. And there won't be any money or way to get the developer to do it. So. Thank you. Any other comments from the board, questions? Um, I've got one. There, there was a the report about the soil sample. <coughs> <that was taken coughs> And the need to do the underlay under the sh under the roads is that taken care of? Okay, Mark, were you thinking of something? Um, I just want to see if Jeff wanted to speak to the concern about the, <coughs> the trail being a lineal path and not going around the and, and cutting through the the growth, the vegetation uh, for that initial chunk um, where Jonathan was talking about being a more circuitous route. Um, can yeah, you, I guess. Uh, can you show me where you all are talking about on the trail? I think I know it's so the lower corner. The cursor. There we are. So it's this little section right down in here. Got it. Um, where initially we had that little island of vegetation. I don't know whether if it's more visible <clears> than <throat> the existing condition plans. Um, the initial proposal had gone on the west side of that vegetation um, it's hard to, these really don't show it yeah it's it's this this little clump of stuff right here <laughs> that extends for probably 300 feet and is maybe 20 30 feet wide maybe it's a little island and the original trail had come on the west side of that between that island of vegetation and the detention basin and the detention basin the left sort of burns up next to you so we had skirt along the edge of it and then across um, and for you know for obvious reasons the desire to stay sort of under a tree canopy or in a more forested setting you know was desired but I don't disagree um, so the the couple of options that we saw were to continue to the end of where that island is um, you can't cross the the drainage channel that's there because you know again to, to satisfy ADA requirements and slope requirements for the walk you would have ended up with a bridge across that um, across that drainage swale that effectively would have been four or five feet you know off the ground um, so it just it, it didn't seem to make a whole lot lot of sense to take that route so then the only other way to go was to come up to the edge the north end of that island come back south to where we move to the west and cross without having to go over that swale. Um, and when you, I guess when you stand out on the site and you look at where, you know, you want to end up to cross and continue across the field from the east side of that vegetation, you're only looking across that 30 or so feet of, you know, what is mostly invasive material. As I said, there's, there's definitely some maples, there's a couple of oaks in there that are definitely mature, um, I think. Um, I think that there won't be any problem, you know, getting a, an eight foot wide trail on existing grade, which was the other big concern that I had when we first looked at it, is that I wasn't convinced that we were gonna be able to get the grades to work without, you know, a lot of disturbance. But we're actually very <coughs> close to existing grade and, you know, meet <coughs> we need to on the, on the west side of this island. Um, and so it seemed, it seemed more desirable to take the sort of the path of least resistance for lack of better terms, but that would effectively take out you know some six inch four inch Norway maples and some um, and some burning bush um, some of the understory that's you know the invasive stuff that's grown in and make that trail connection rather than you know again for a multi-use trail that's eight foot wide and paved and meant for bicycles and you know it it didn't seem to me as from a design standpoint to make this big circuitous you know loop with the with the trail um, when you know it's it, there's very little disturbance effectively that that gets um as a result of you know where it's shown now um and I, it preserves the the integrity of the forest canopy over you know overhead and and you know everything that i think people were were um, striving to maintain and it, it do you feel like it's more of a cow path route now it's more of a cow path route the route that people would take i think i think it's that yeah i mean again when you look at where you're headed into you know that that where that forest edge is where the beech trees are as you veer off to the you know to the northwest off the existing trail 
you know, you're you're looking at that destination. So again, from a from a design standpoint, from a you know experience standpoint, to me is a, you know again a wayfinding type of thing. You you know you want to see where you're heading and moving in that direction seemed like the obvious you know obvious path of um, to take rather than coming up and turning around going south and then you know turning and going back north again. Okay. But there really is very little disturbance um, in that island of vegetation that's, that's needed. So. <clears throat> Isn't the idea of the trail there, like to be out in the woods and recreation, and you're not like trying to get from point A to point B, as he's describing? Well, on the multi-use trail, I do think it's more transportation-like okay. that the that the other trail would be the one that you <coughs> take a walk for fun. Mm -hmm. is, is how I think of it. That yeah. drops right down to. Um, Prince Street, so that's the um, access. Oh, okay. It goes down the sled, the edge of the sledding hill. Gotcha. What about the other way? Where does it go? Um, well, ultimately, the plan would be to hook up so it can cross the river. So it doesn't, from a transportation point of view, though, it doesn't go any place in the other direction. Right. It, it serves. It serves the hill. It, the hill oh, yeah, terminate. Well, not that. Yeah. You know, at Village Hill, but the idea is that there will be a provision for future connection. Yes, sir. Um, there was a list of uh, possible conditions by staff. Should we go over that while the public comments? Nice question so first. <clears throat> um, uh, on the issue of signage that's been raised, <clears throat> I would assume that the developer would have no objection to installing some signs either during construction or more <coughs> if they thought it would alleviate some concerns of the neighbors. I mean, it's an inconsequential expense. Uh, I mean, would that be correct? Would uh, you be willing to? I would rather let the traffic find its own path and try to it force make sense. Um, So you're saying, so you're saying that some, your opinion would be that signage would not assist in alleviating some problems? I would tend to concur with what I heard Carolyn say. Either th and that applies to cons during construction as well yeah. as permanently? Yeah. Would signage make it worse? I think changing the name from Olander. I'm not Olander. asking about that, though. It's construction signs. Right. Cons Signs, right. I mean, not cha I'm not asking about changing street names. Okay. Uh, Just like construction traffic this way. Yeah. Like that. that sort of thing, or identifying the direction of certain addresses. Uh, well, I mean, I'm. I think, yeah, I'm the one that suggested identifying, you know, 1 through 50 this way, 50 through 100 that way. I think that that's more clarity. That makes that makes sense. And to me. Well, that's what I'm. Uh, well, I'm fine with that. Yeah, I'm fine with that. The direction, in other words, numbering for clarity. This one to fifty this way, fifty-one to hundred to the right. And I've seen that in many, many places. To and assisting a signage during construction that might alleviate some traffic, some disruption uh, for that period of time. Does that make the, sense? The, the loop is what was in the master plan, which was a, had a traffic study, and there didn't seem to be any issues. It wasn't named, or What's that? It was not named. The, the issue for confusion is naming, and uh, it's cheaper to, to put up construction signs than to replace the city signs. We still think that the naming would solve a lot of things. I mean, I don't know why we have public input if, there, there's, if good suggestions are discarded. Well, and, no, wait. I, I, sorry. I, yeah, I resist that. I think we've, we've been through many meetings on this. We've done <coughs> a lot of improvements on the trail. We've done, you know, I think there, there's the public comment process has had some effect here. Um, did I see another comment in the back? Yes. Please. 
Shall I come up and introduce you? Yes, we need your name and address for the record. Uh, I'm Leslie Peebles, and I live at 111 Mosier Street. Mm -hmm. I just have two <laughs> comments, or one comment and one question. The comment would be that if we look at this, can I find the cursor? Yeah. There it is. <laughs> okay. This street here, this loop, actually extends from Olander, and it extends from um, Village Hill. So I don't know why it doesn't make, it makes a difference whether this is called Olander or Village Hill loop. And if we want to s sort of direct traffic entering it along Village Hill, because that's the major spine, why not call it Village Hill loop? It's continuing the name of the street. Anyway, jog. it's a 90 degree turn it's off jog, yeah. village. Is it? So yeah. I think of that as an intersection. Four crossing. Yeah. Okay. Is what it comes off. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> anyway, I, I don't think it will be confusing to call it Higgins Loop or Higgins Circle. Okay. But in and any your case, question? My question was um, Jonathan Wright had mentioned uh, the possibility of creating some of those trails ahead of time. And I just wanted to hear whether there was a response to that. Thank you. So what's the phasing on the trails? Um, good question. I don't know as though they're, it's specifically called out. I mean, I think the, obviously the phase one portion, which is the, you know, the extension of Olander right now, um, would effectively, you know, create the, the, um, you know, the foundation for that for that trail improvement um, up to that intersection um, and I, I could see that piece as being part of phase one but it, it hasn't been specified um, <coughs> necessarily which which phases include which portions of trail I think you, I mean you're, you certainly could specify which trail segments you want in what phasing um, I can say that it, it wouldn't make sense for the city to take the trail until development on both sides of that trail were completed. Right. So it would, so there, there's sort of two parts of it. We, you know, the the construction and the dedication. If you would bring up the trails again. Sure. My initial thinking on that is that the multi-use trail is in the middle of the development project, um, except on the far southern end so maybe you bring it up to the the development area and then we just set that aside until it happens as you've done the development but I'm interested in your thinking about when the red line trail would be tackled most of that with the exception of what's shown on the Smith property already exists I mean most most of what is is shown there in red is is currently a, a wide gravel or broken bituminous roadway, right. you know, left over. Um, but you're going to improve that one segment on the northwest. It would, have, it would be right. It would be it would be <coughs> acted gravel path to match, you know, what was what's um, what's in the northern portion. I would suggest that would go with the construction in the north. So phase four, uh, their houses close by. That would be the appropriate time to regrade there. Mm -hmm. And until such time, that path would. I presume would stay in its current exactly. condition. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And is there any risk to assuming that Smith College will work with you on doing the east side? I don't anticipate any. I, they've, they've got you know a host of trails there now. Um, I don't, and I, I'm not aware of any issues you know with the public using that land for for trail access. I, I just want to be clear. Are you suggest? Are you assuming that? transformations would build that trail because I'm not sure that's what I heard right. and it certainly wouldn't necessarily be a requirement of this permit because they're not required to create any other. Yeah, trail. no, I was grinning thinking when they were initially saying it that, that, that they were assuming that they would build a trail on Smith. No, I don't, that's okay. not what I think. Okay. But I, I just am questioning what we are assuming Smith will do. I don't think Smith is going to do anything except maybe give permission for someone to come on and cut or place, you know, material. Okay. Well, they've certainly been very agreeable to doing that through the Lyman Estate for the neighborhood. I, I think that's a fair assumption. I just wanted to see what we were talking about. Yes. And to clarify, I was proposing to, to do the trail on the land that we will temporarily own mm -hmm. uh, and then stop at the, at the Smith property. 
property line, but happy to want that trail and flag it and, and work with people. Uh, but that's that's subject to Smith saying okay and subject to some of the other people uh, wanting to make that trail. Okay. Any other thoughts we want to get through? I just wonder if we want to look at those the possible, possible conditions, conditions. Yeah, from staff. Um, I'd be happy to read them for the discussion. <coughs> we'll actually we'll, we'll get to it. Uh, if you do that. Okay. <coughs> so uh, prior to endorsement, final plan shall be amended to incorporate all plan changes as required in the conditions and comments by the DPW. So I think you would be expecting that. Plan shall be stamped by a registered land surveyor and a registered professional engineer. Final construction quantity shall be submitted for review and approval by the board. All additional items, including granite, tree protection, and any other items not submitted must be in the final construction cost calculations. Financial performance guarantee shall be established in accordance with the subdivision regulations. Excuse me, Devin. Uh, Jeff, have you, heard the applicant? have you seen these yet? I've not seen the conditions, no. Okay. Some of this stuff was provided. These are these are all what I said. Yeah, these are okay. these are about okay. the timing. So this okay. is what was suggested to be done before in okay. endorsement, prior to construction, and I, this is for the public's benefit as uh, too. Uh, written tabulation demonstrating that the projected build out of the three phases at Village Hill are within the permitted sewer capacity. This confirmation shall include the westerly parcel of the North Campus. Uh, certified arborist <coughs> shall report on the proposed layout and possible impacts of tree protection proposed for particular trees that are identified uh, by number on the on the planting plan as 15, 16, 48, 68, and 69, five trees, uh, to determine if the measure shown will provide enough protection to ensure that the trees survive construction activity. The arborist should submit his or her findings to the Office of Planning and Sustainability prior to the site preparation in those areas. Could I also wanted to add, um, I'm, I think it makes sense to also have, ensure that the evaluation looks at the boardwalk crossing to make sure that those columns are in the right location, that they're you know small enough not to have an impact on the, on the tree roots. Good. The applicant must record all covenants related to maintenance and infrastructure of trap rack, rack, rock gravel, sidewalks and other areas including snow removal from sidewalks and path, private roadways and utilities underneath shall be spelled out in the owner covenants. Covenants must be reviewed for consistency with the approval and regulations by staff prior to recording. Uh, then there's a uh, Prior to construction of each phase, construction plans for each phase shall be submitted for review at least 30 days prior to the bidding. Plans for phase one and two shall show a temporary hammerhead that will be constructed. Base course may be used in compliance with the city's hammerhead standards. Pre-construction meetings shall be held prior to construction of each phase of contractors if contractors change from phase one. All specimen trees shall have protection installed prior to commencement of each phase. Prior to commencement of phase three, construction as shown on the subdivision plans, tree protection for specimen trees 68 and 69 shall be installed. The city's tree warden shall determine the appropriate measures to protect the trees. Um, Can I also add, maybe it might be appropriate to add that the construction um, um, plans for the contractor should um, include direction for traffic, for construction traffic. I mean, that might be a way to address that, at least in the construction, pre-construction meeting, mm -hmm. that it's clear in the documents that the contractor gets that um, where the preferred access route is to the site. <coughs> so that's the, those, those three big hunks of information were about uh, the, the phasing, uh, the, you know, what should be done in order prior to the different steps. Uh, now on a different topic prior to the first lot sale or unit sale of any individual to any individual homeowner open space the open space except for the trail 
shown to be allocated to the city and offered by the applicant must be granted to the city. The portion of the allocation that is the trail shall be deeded as offered prior to final closeout of the project. Um, do you want to caveat that in any way based on our discussion of what might be done early? Um, I think that would be more in the phasing, just, you know, a separate condition maybe for phasing of construction if you feel like the, <coughs> excuse me, the main trail should happen in a certain phase. Um, I'd just be concerned of impacts or construction activity that's happening, you know, yeah, in phases. Yeah, I, I can't so see the sure. multi-use trail getting done ahead of time except on the southern entrance. Um, all housing units must have front porches facing the street as specified in the design standards. <coughs> put wide easements for private sewer face force mains that cross the road layout from lot 6, 24, 7, and 25 shall be shown on plans and shall be drafted and recorded by the applicant as part of the street petition filing for street acceptance. Easement language must be approved by the city prior to submission. Oh, can I stop you for a second? There, 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 that group of conditions, I think, have been addressed in the plan amendment. Uh -huh. So I had um, recommended, actually, let me go to my, I have a strikeout version. Um, red lines. Oh, one. Um, sorry. I just want to be clear. Um, uh, it wouldn't hurt if I went ahead and read them yeah. and you told us which ones were taken But I have a question in that is they have changed the <laughs> lots and reconfigured them. Are these numbers for the old or for the new? Uh, they're for the um, they're for the old ones, but those were applicable to the lots, I think, that didn't change. Okay. At least two permanent monuments in compliance with uh, Statute 290-48 must be placed on site and shown in the plans prior to construction. The control points shall be tied to and employ NAVD 1988 and NAD 83. Tell me what that means. <laughs> it's, it's the standard. <laughs> it's, a, um, it's a standard um, <laughs> control points and measurements that surveyors have to use so, it's, so that everyone's using the same um, same standard for um, <laughs> just taking notes, and that's all. That's one of the ones that I'm recommending to delete because I trust that. Excuse me. <coughs> Crosswalk markings at intersections and on Orlander shall match what has been constructed previously on all other streets at Village Hill with the stamped asphalt duratherm detail. Final plan shall reflect these details on sheet 8.3. Maintenance of, maintenance of vegetation in the right-of-way except for trees and maintenance driveway aprons shall be the responsibility of the Owners Association and reflected in the covenants. The private sewer force main serving lot 6, 7, and 24 shall be privately owned and maintained. A 30-inch wide sewer easement, nope, a 30-foot wide sewer easement with the city will be required for the force mains that cross Orlander Drive and serve lot 6 and 7. Easement shall be shown on sheets 5.1 and 5.4. This is the easement that I was referring to before where DBW was amenable to a 15 foot mm -hmm. wide easement in the location, and those have been added to the plans. Right. So, um, 10, 11, 12, and 13, I'm proposing, or 14 are, probably, are no longer necessary because they've made those changes to the plan. Okay. <coughs> um, any further discussion on our part? Yes, sir. One last item. Uh, I thought I heard you say that the homeowners association would be responsible in the DPW conditions. What are they referring to? Maintenance and vegetation of the right of way, except for the trees and maintenance <coughs> of the driveway aprons, shall be the responsibility of the homeowners association as reflected in the covenant. Are those the drainage swales between the Yes. What, mm -hmm. uh, what homeowners association is that? Is that a Summit Oaks homeowners association, not the North Property Assembly Association? That should, that should be paid for by the people who use it, not, not uh, shared with those of us who do not create that. Maybe. 
I, it's typically how it works. Right. Yeah. yeah. Is there going to be a homeowners association for that group? Yeah. yeah. For your group? Um, there can there can be yeah. It must be. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Devin, can we or Jeff, can you further clarify back to that 20 foot width for a length of 30 feet if we're going to be specific on those two driveways on the left, uh, what the footage is roughly? Yeah. Oh, so under the waiver? Yeah. <laughs> I think you said 15 feet on the easterly side? Eastland. And 25 on the I'm so sorry. Are we saying should be, yeah. Are we saying it should be at least? <coughs> yes. Even just approximating. That. Yeah, I can I can scale it off real quick and tell you. So I'm going to note the length of narrowing to 20 feet on the west side is 25 feet, and on the east side is 20 feet in length. 15 and 25. Yeah, so the east side is probably 15 feet. The west side is closer to 25. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. At least to the driveway. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the, the staff recommendations, the things that we brought up is that the 20 foot width uh, as amended, 15 foot drain even as Jeff mentioned, which was approved by TPW. Yep. Uh, the boardwalk crossing, which Carolyn mentioned, the deconstruction and construction signage <coughs> as a guide, uh, and what are the thoughts about a lane or loop or renaming that road? I kind of like loop myself. I wouldn't change the name, but it does. You get in there and it turns around to recognize what it is and it tells you that it can get there in more than one way. I don't see how that makes it any worse and it does keep the same name, which I agree with you. Different names in different places is really tricky. Yeah, I'm, yeah I, I feel like the west side is more an intersection than it is a turn of, of a road there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or land or loop at least conveys the information that it mm -hmm. that it's a loop. Right. Could I get a nod of heads that we're in agreement yeah. on that? Okay. Yeah, that's all I had. Um, there was a question about the <coughs> uh, the caliper that came up in the public comment. Yes. <coughs> the dimensions. Um, yeah. It's, can you tell me again uh, why you would change it? So the, the bigger issue is more from a, a uh, tree nursery nuts. stock standpoint that these smaller trees are typically available and you know smaller sizes. You don't you don't I mean the, the, they're smaller tree species, so you don't typically find a lot of those readily available at nurseries in a three inch caliper mm -hmm. size or four inch caliper. So it's size. really the difficulty of finding them, and it's not really. Because I, I think you started out saying it was for the you know the understory or the the, the growth, but it's no, that was right. that was a different that was a different mm -hmm. item that that referred <coughs> to identification of trees on the whole site that are 20 inches in caliper and above that needed to be protected. So that was a different issue. That I think the item that you're referring to is the caliper of the mm -hmm. new trees that gets planted in the right of way, mm -hmm. um, and so. As I was saying, that typically the issue is that you know we've got I don't know 70, 80 of these trees that you you can't necessarily find the quantity of trees that you need of a smaller species in large caliper you know sizes. You know it's 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 like trying to find a, an eight inch diameter oak tree to plant you know in the in the in the street right away. That you can find them; they're really expensive, but you're not going to find you know 70 or 80 of them. But the phasing should work to your advantage in this regard. 
in terms of the quantity. The you don't have quantity. to find them all at once. You don't have to find all of them at once. <coughs> did we have more of them? There are more. There are, and there are more of them. Yeah. I mean, we did. We did put them in closer because they are smaller trees. So where we would typically have, you know, a 30-foot space, and we've got in some cases 15 feet between them. Carolyn, when we hit this argument on a regular basis, I mean, we've set the tree standard for the city to be a certain tree list and a certain caliber. Um, I, I like the fact that they're installing more smaller trees. There is, an, I think, an argument to be made, although it would be for them to make and not me, that a smaller tree actually sets better than actually, you know, it grows into its space is what I think of it. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure of that, but I'm hard hard pressed to think that we, we set a, a city standard and, and I, I think I need a really good reason not to use the standard that was set by the committee that was supposed to do that. Well, you could, I mean, as an alternative, they could always come back and prove to you that there's no, they've checked 25 nurseries or whatever in, the, in 100 miles and they can't get anything. Um, you know, or, um, and so keep it at three until proven otherwise. Well, I think Alan's point that, that this will be phased, I mean, they aren't all 80 of them aren't probably coming at the same time, are they, Jeff? Um, any other thoughts other than mine on that? Is there a difference here, though, between if you're trying to put in a tree that is going to remain smaller because of the... No, I think... <coughs> In time, it will get to be a size, so it's whatever right, the mature height. It starts height. off at two inches. It's going to take longer to reach that size, which is one of the points that's made. So it's mm -hmm. not. It'll it's, still. It's still going to be a small size. tree. It's just going to take longer to get yeah. there. And they're starting yeah. off with a less expensive specimen. Yeah. So. Well, am I to think they're going to start trimming these trees for the solar gain? No, that's why they're selecting. That's why they're, that's why they're so selecting tree. small trees. Mm -hmm. So when they're mature, they're only going to be so tall, but instead of starting off at three inch and having eight to 10 years to reach that mature level, they're gonna take 12 years because they start off at two inches. Okay. Which I don't know if that's a reason, like you say, that we have a standard yeah. and okay. we wanna set the precedent for other developments to start off with smaller caliper trees. Yeah, I, I'm inclined not to, uh, yeah. not to yeah, <coughs> support that waiver. <coughs> I'll just make one comment quick too, is that I think, I, is the standard three inches or Three inches. Um, yep, I'm pretty sure. I'll double three check. Three or four inches. So, what, and what we're proposing is two and a half to three inch. Because that's typically, from my experience, the you know for for these tree species in particular, that's sort of the standard you know nursery stock size that you can find readily available. When you get bigger than that, three inches starts to get into that you know that caliper size that gets a little bit harder to find with some tree species. So it's not it's we're not we're not suggesting two inch. <coughs> I thought that was in your yeah, application. The, the waiver shows two inches. Oh, okay, the plans then yeah the plans the plans show two and a half to three versus three and above. Right. And more of them. It sounds like it's pretty close to the and it, and it's a sh it's a solar this is a solar design development so more street trees. Two and a half to three instead of fewer of them three inch. Probably this is going to cost more money than the other one. It's, it's what's right for the. But formally, the waiver that's being requested is for two inch. Yeah. So, so it'd be something less than the two Reject that waiver and say, if we're agreeable, you know, two and a half to three, or just leave it at the standard. If, if you can see what that is, yeah. Carolyn. Um. into this section to be much more detailed <laughs> <laughs> well the proposed two and a half to three sounds pretty reasonable not the two inch though All right. do you actually go out and look at those Carolyn does Louie look at that 
No, Louis does not look at it. They need to show, um, yeah, we, we look at it, we check it. Um, after the county. But your point was that two and a half to three are hard to find, and that's why you wanted to plant two inch. So I, I'm just confused about what the applicants the, proposing. The, the larger size is, I, sorry, the two and, a, two and a half to three is a, is a standard nursery stock size that you can find pretty much across the board. Once you get above that, it gets a little bit more specific in terms of tree species. And specifically with trees that are smaller in nature, mm -hmm. so smaller tree species, okay. it's, it's <coughs> bigger, larger caliper trees. But there's no argument to be had over they're going to get bigger. I mean, they're going, sure. yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. it may do so slower, but I don't, um, yeah, the, Carolyn had the answer on the, the tree caliper is three inches in our, in our ordinance. Um, and I, I ask about the measuring it because I think the plus or minus half inch is probably what happens just by virtue of it happening. And so, um, would would you all want it at three inches or do you want to vary from that and say at least two and a half i guess i'd prefer to stay with the standard okay to rationalize going down to two and a half to the people who develop that standard right i think we're not asking for over three if two and a half to three is the standard stock we're just looking for a standard stock size just the the higher end of that okay um, anything else that feels like we, it's un unsettled? Yes, sir. Sorry, one more very quick public comment. Okay. Uh, Nick Warren, 79 Olander. Um, I wanted to uh, add a quick thought on the <coughs> path through the woods. Um, it occurs to me that you're not going to want people, the developer's not going to want people walking through even phase one because it's going to be difficult as it's going on, as the construction happens. I think it would very much be in the developer's interest to actually create that trail, make it happen, cut it, pave it, stone it. I know you don't want to do it, but I think that, and actually I think that having plunked this uh, development down much denser than we had thought, you guys should take the hit and make that trail. I think it's in your interest, and it's certainly in ours, the rest of us on the Hill, to not have to walk through the construction. Um, <coughs> that's all. And you're talking about the blue trail. No, I'm talking about the red trail. The red Sorry, let's see if I can find the... Uh, Sorry, no, I just wanted you know to make I mean. sure we understood it. Yeah, the one that's the far west west trail that hooks into the trail across the, across the top. Essentially, people's access to the uh, woods above is being uh, highly compromised. By the, by the development. The great thing about working this out was that it's getting around that problem. But I think that the, uh, what's, what looks now to be a decision that you will only take it to the edge of uh, Transformations property and then basically we're on our own, on our own. We have nobody here saying who's going to actually do that. I think you should do it and I think it actually should be done. That's, we're talking, that's the Smith College property. On the yes, on, on, the, on the Smith so property. It's not the applicant yet. There. I mean, they well, the applicant there. can do it, but the applicant would have to have, obviously, the Smith um, uh, permission to do so. Yeah, I, well, we I wouldn't advocate make, the applicant. We can't make that uh, a qualification to do something on the property that's not owned by the applicant. That doesn't mean it this, isn't a good idea for you right, to say it, though. Right. Yeah, well, I'm saying it, and I think that in the end, we're stuck with this problem of, and Carolyn, you've, you've talked about us having some easements or something with, with, with respect to Smith. We have to figure out how that's, how that's gonna happen and who's gonna pay for it. And I'm not sure the best way to do it. Um, I'm strongly advocating that Carter do it. Uh, if not, we need to figure out who is gonna do it and how it's gonna happen and how it should happen soon to make the construction safe and workable. Do you recognize that he wouldn't want the traffic increased while he's in construction? That is, was my assumption. He would want, because right now, the trails run right into the construction. So I think he would want to divert foot traffic over to the west. I'm, I'm sorry, to the east. Okay. Thank you. That's all.
We haven't had a good 11 o'clock meeting in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure the word good in an 11 o'clock <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit of an oxymoron. Well, on, on that note, I move to close public comment then. <laughs> Second. Second. By Ann. All in favor? Um, so to, before you sort of move forward and you know, might have more discussion, there are three permits on the table again, just sort of to circle back. There's the subdivision approval, um, which all the whole um, board members um, vote on. And then there are the two separate um, site plan um, for the build out of the properties. And everyone's eligible, uh, all the votes are counted towards those two. Um, and so I would suggest to separate the subdivision vote from <coughs> the site plan votes. Mm -hmm. And you could separate each site plan or you could put them together um, as one. Not to make <coughs> the evening longer than it already is, but because I wasn't on the board when the mass development started their, their master plans. So I, I am curious. I, I hear, you know, the concerns that they bought in under a different understanding of what was going to go in. So can you speak to that, like sure. what our purview is with that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's sort of always been the moving target issue with mass development. They had a concept plan, and they've always said, this is conceptually where this type of housing unit is that we're envisioning. It's, it was never meant to be a number of units on the map. Mm -hmm. So they plunked down townhouse units, and they specifically said, don't count the individual boxes on there or the lines because this is really just representative of the fact that in this area we want townhouses and in this area we want single-family mm -hmm. Detached, we want density, you know, mixed use over here and single family over there. And they, um, over the years, have sort of changed that. I mean, the original mm -hmm. section had detached estate lots on the north end loop, and it was six boxes. You know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it was meant to be six houses or whatever the number is, but it was certainly meant to represent a very low density build out. So, um, the number has always been um, used for the total number of housing units was always in the original calculation for the MEPA filing and then that got amended to allow 100 additional units or 110 additional units in 2010 and the master plan got changed a little bit there was a North employees home that was torn down it was that was supposed to be you know a multi family or eight units up in that northern section and that got taken out during that whole um, permit process so um, there's an, there hasn't been a shift in the total number of units it was just um, you know unfortunately I think it's the way mass development represented on the plan and that um, you know that probably got instilled in people's head as sort of the number of units as opposed to the text number that was approved for the overall development. Mm -hmm. In other words, it was more schematic. Very. Well, and there was a committee that met on it. I mean, it's it's <coughs> frustrating to me over the time frame because sometimes it, it it was it was a guide that continually wasn't followed mm -hmm. as, a, as a guiding yeah. statement. Yeah, um, there was. Originally, low-income housing was going to be included, more mixed use. I mean, there were a lot of things that have changed over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, with mass development, pretty much saying they they found developers that could do pieces as they found developers that wanted to do those pieces. Well, to the extreme on the south campus, you know, that in no way represents that original, the very first conceptual plan from from mass development. I mean, there's one company there. That's it. Yeah. And that was not the the initial schematic. Why was Ice Pond Road in that mixture? What's the relationship? Um, because that was also part of the state hospital holdings. That land all the way out there. Um, it's discontinuous, isn't it? <coughs> right, but it was part of the whole state property. Mm -hmm. that they were um, divesting. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. That got put in there. Okay. <coughs> So, uh, Carolyn, back to um, 
the motion. We've got two site plans. One is for the site development. One's for the co-housing, and then the other one's for the rest of it. So the okay. co-housing came in as a separate site plan application from the co-land <coughs> loop. But we can do one site plan for both. Yeah, you could do one approval for site plan and for one both. Of you want yeah, in fact, that would be my first question of you. I think we should do the subdivision <coughs> separately. Mm -hmm. But then my question of you, the board members, are you, is there any distinction in your mind that calls for two votes on the site plan, or would one vote do it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, Mark, could I believe that you've been making notes on conditions for a subdivision? And one between the other. Um, well, um, uh, well, you know, I actually, think most of these were subdivision yeah. related. Yeah. Um, there's, there, um, um, the only piece which I don't think necessarily has to be an approval is if it was about the porches, but you do need to approve a waiver for the smaller porch um, under the site plan. So that, I think, is the only piece that would be distinctly just under the site plan mm -hmm. um, and then otherwise all the conditions and other waivers relate to the subdivision um, <coughs> and then you in, in you know eliminate you uh, I heard you say that you didn't want to approve the waiver for the tree um, caliper reduction um, and um, the length of narrowing the length of um, the narrowing was 15 feet on the west and 25 feet on the east. Yep. <coughs> so I've got a list of them, but no one could read my writing. So um, can I just go down through them and then we can do it conditions as listed? Mm -hmm. So it's the 15 foot, uh, allowing the 15 foot drain in yep. lieu of the 30 feet. Mm -hmm. It's the length of narrowing to approximately 20 feet on the west side and 15 feet uh, length of the narrowing of the road on the east side. And it wasn't uh, 25. Okay. Yeah. 15, 15 on the west. 15 on the west, 25 on the west. Yes. Um, construction plans should ID preferred construction routes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd like to clarify on number <coughs> nine on the one you use, Carolyn, that the Homeowners Association was for the development that is being proposed, so it's for that subset of, of the association. I'm not sure what its name is. It's I'm just calling it in your proposed homes development at this point. Yeah. Um, and a, a note for the address distinctions on the route in and around a lander loop. Street signs. Yep. <coughs> and is the subdivision also the porch story? Okay. Yeah, so th those are the conditions. <coughs> the boardwalk crossing as well. Right. The boardwalk mm -hmm. supports. Uh, Where does Olander loop? We can improve the subdivision as yep. Olander loop. Yep. Um, and. You actually said the arborist will look at the boardwalk. Footage. That was my recommended condition yeah. in that set that you received and the applicant received. Okay. And I'll trust you to check that the tree numbers and the lot numbers that we have been talking about tonight are the ones on the final plan. Um, yes. Any other thoughts on conditions? So we're adding to that the list of conditions that you read from staff. Mm -hmm. So can I get a motion? I'll make a motion. So this is the subdivision we're doing first. Mm -hmm. yes. So I make a motion to approve the definitive subdivision uh, for Energy Positive Homes LLC for new strike so and associated site development for 83 residential units, including single multifamily and co-housing off Olander Drive, formerly State Hospital in Northampton Map. 31C-17 with the conditions noted <coughs> and the conditions noted, uh, the conditions noted by Devin and the conditions noted by staff. Second. Second by. Okay. Eighty-five. Yes. Eighty-five homes. Eighty-five homes. 
Thank you. Okay. Just lost two. Thank you, Boris. Boris and my dear. Uh, and, and to that point, the, the waivers, um, so we denied two waivers. Or I guess the recommendation is only the, the ones we, right. we recommend. Right. So right. that's good. Okay. Sorry. N and nothing else. Yeah. No. <coughs> and we got a second? Yeah. Second. All in favor? Can't vote, right? Can't vote. No, not on this one. And is and Al vote. and the other it just doesn't bill? Right. So it, it, it makes if, if it's, you, I saw a hand. Just raise your hands, everybody. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. So you need, um, so we take six of the eight votes. So, but it's uni It's considered unanimous. Mm -hmm. Six to zero. Okay. Uh, now for the major site plan, which we agreed to take the site plan and the co-housing as one uh, one element. I think the condition <coughs> that we need to talk about is the watches. Yeah, and we've closed public hearing. Yeah. Right? Um, just I thought I heard um, Jeff say that there was a, like a five by seven, five or seven, seven six two, by. but that there were th three options. Three and options so for porches, but they all had a porch. Either, yeah. The right. So what's the third? What's the third? Well, option? Six by nine is the is the standard, the standard. Is the minimum. Mm -hmm. And then there was a bigger one. Mm -hmm. So That's um, oh, okay. those were yeah, the, so the smallest was. Right. The, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and you all might enjoy the thought of me out on my porch last night with a tape measure. I can say that mine is five by six by eight so, <laughs> um, gives you perspective yeah mm -hmm. no, it, it, that's exactly what I wanted was to see what a five by seven would mm -hmm. feel like and it's it's a yeah. good size porch mm -hmm. so that's the only condition for the site plan, for the site plan. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll make the motion then for to approve the site plan approval for energy positive homes LLC for new street and associated site development for five residential units including single one family and co-housing off of Linder Drive, formerly State Hospital, Northampton Math, 31C-17, with the one condition on the front porches. Second. Second. All in favor? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Holding it in. We get to go home? Yeah. Yeah, somebody's got to make a motion. Yeah. Oh. oh. Motion to adjourn? Do it. I, I make a motion that we adjourn. Second. Second. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> um.